Welcome everyone. Glad you can join me today. We're going to take another uh, deep dive into the mind and into the spiritual awakening of, of through forgiveness that Jesus is is taking us on this journey. He's he's showing us the way. Uh, everyone says on the surface they want to be free of of pain. They want to be free of guilt. They want to be free of, of sadness and hurt. Uh, they don't want any more stress and anxiety in their life. Well, then we just have to follow Jesus, the Master who has transcended all of these emotions because they were all generated by the ego and Jesus just awoke. And he's our symbol of awakening. So now we have his uh, beautiful Course in Miracles to lead us and today we're going to look at some things in the Course and we're going to look at some very deep teachings today. Today I have to say, well, you know, today is a root canal day. I hope you guys are ready for a root canal. You know, sometimes you enjoy getting your fillings and polishing your teeth, teeth whitening and all this and this. Ah, But then eventually you get called in for the root canal and you usually you say, knock me out. <laughs> I don't want, I don't even want to know about this. Uh, this is way too much for me to handle. I'm not, I don't live for root canals. But actually Jesus, he likes to have work with us and do the root canals in our mind because what's underneath the surface of the teeth and gums is, is the roots and the roots is the subconscious mind. So everything you perceive in this world is, is a projection of the unconscious mind. That's why on the surface of things, a person can say, why do bad things happen to me? I'm a, I'm a kind generally. I'm kind and sweet and loving and then why do I have to have a, a disaster? <laughs> I, it's ruining my day. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's ruining my life, these disasters. If I could just eliminate the disasters. And Jesus says, well, we have to we have to raise up the unconscious mind and see the impossibility of the ego, the impossibility of evil, the impossibility of error. And once we can see the impossibility of error, then we're home free because we're the Christ. We've always been the Christ and we just need to wake up and remember ourselves as the living Christ, like Jesus did. He's a great, uh, great way shower, a great example. Now, to put this into context a little bit, I, the past uh, few weeks I've been talking about my friend Dorothy. Uh, I even had a, a friend write to me from Colorado and was going through intense anxiety and she listened to one of the recent uh, movie uh, commentaries and she said, oh my gosh, that popped me completely out of my anxiety. I went from intense anxiety to uh, laughter and she said, I learned to channel my inner Dorothy, she said. <laughs> and that's a pretty good uh, compliment to Dorothy, actually. After, after going from anxiety to peace, then you can say, oh, I'm channeling my inner Dorothy, my inner Christ, my inner Jesus, my inner Buddha. Now, some of you who work with A Course in Miracles know that, you know, there's 31 chapters in the text. There's a, a workbook. And then there's a manual for teachers, including a clarification of terms. But some of you have heard me refer to the text. In the middle of Jesus' text, kind of more towards, just past the middle, uh, Jesus basically spends nine chapters talking about the biggest block to the awareness of, of God. In other words, Jesus basically says, you're home free except for one thing. And if you can get this one thing, then you're home free. So it must be pretty important. And what he's going to do is he's going to expose the ego's deepest tricks, the ego's deepest defense against God, and the ego's greatest gift, uh, its biggest weapon. He's, he's going to go down to the ego's atomic bomb and he's going to dismantle the bomb and say, you don't have to be afraid of this bomb because I've already dismantled it. Uh, you're just afraid of something that the ego is trying to scare you with. 
but but actually I've already dismantled it. It's 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 diffused. The bomb is diffused. So relax, I got you. <laughs> There's not going to be a bomb. <laughs> it's already diffused. And it's so important that Jesus spends not one or two chapters on it, not four or five chapters on it. He actually spends nine chapters in his text out of 31 talking about this boasted weapon of the ego, this its greatest defense. In fact, at one point Jesus says, you're almost home to heaven. You just have one thing blocking you from heaven, and that is the special love relationship. <laughs> See, the ego had to come up with something in this world that would be attractive, that will get your mind's attention, that will help you in its purposes to stay identified with the body and, and not remember that you're spirit. You see, it's very important to the ego that you buy the substitute for love. The body was made as a substitute for love. If you don't believe me, check out Madonna's Ray of Light <laughs> album. She's got a song on there, Substitute for Love. And it's a sad song. And, and I would have to say that the ego substitute for love is extremely attractive. It sparkles like diamonds and rubies. It, it is so attractive that it's one of the biggest things that this world seems to offer to keep you from going inside and recognizing yourself as the Christ. To keep you from the kingdom of heaven within is the great grand distraction of the special relationship that's projected from the ego onto the surface of consciousness to catch your eye, to lure you away from the kingdom of heaven, to keep you asleep for centuries, and maybe even millennium. <laughs> Some of you don't like reincarnation, but this is what the ego does to keep you asleep for millennium. <laughs> it's not talking about one lifetime. It will it will pursue you beyond this lifetime. Just when you think you've succeeded, it says sleep. <laughs> Back to sleep you go one more lifetime. You aren't even close to escaping. You, I've got you. Like the Wizard of Oz, the Wicked Witch of the West. Yee, my pretty, I've got you. You know, the ego is, it's so sneaky and tricky and ingenious. In fact, uh, there's a couple teachers of the course, Ken Wapnick, and Gary Renard, who I've heard them both say, in terms of the ego making time and space, making this entire cosmos, both Ken and, and Gary have said the word impressive. <laughs> Ken Wapnick and Gary Renard say impressive. I don't actually believe that because I don't think illusions are ever impressive. <laughs> I, I think uh, God is impressive and Christ is impressive and the Holy Spirit's impressive, but I'm not really impressed by how ingenious the ego is to project such a complicated world of time and space, such a vast dream of so many intricacies that you get completely fooled about your true identity and completely caught up in the quicksand, caught, totally enamored and inured with illusions. I don't think that's impressive. I, I think that's Foolish, actually, and that, that's my word for for the ego and its projections. The, the ego is the fool because it's a death wish, and, and God is eternal life, and Christ is eternal, and there is no love but God's love. There aren't different kinds of love. Jesus tells us in the workbook, there's only one love, and that's the love of God. And when you're in that experience, you are intoxicated in love. You are drunk on love. You, you are awake in love. You are joyful in love. You are gleeful in love. Love is everything. And, and there is nothing but that love. So that's the point of A Course in Miracles, is to teach you that love is all there is. Anything else that you're perceiving is, is a distraction away from God's love. Jesus does say at one point, he says, you never have really considered removing every scrap of fear that you still hold on to in your mind. You never have really honestly considered to remove every scrap of fear. 
Who's in it with me? Who's in it with me for removing every scrap of fear and knowing the love of God? That's all we're here for. We're not here for any other reason. We, nothing else is going to get our attention now, except knowing who we are as the Christ. So, a while back, I think probably uh, maybe two or three years ago, or a while back in Mexico, I, I showed a movie that was called Whitney. Has anybody ever heard of Whitney Houston? Well, what, what a movie. I've actually had people tell me that they had trouble watching that movie with my commentary because they, they were so heartbroken. They couldn't stand to see this beautiful, vibra vi vivacious, joyful, gleeful Christian, young Christian woman who was all swept up in the love of Jesus. And then as her voice was angelic, her voice was, uh, like we could say, not of this world, uh, the ego jumped on that voice and then through a series of things that it does, fame, fortune, and then of course it waits till the end. The, the, the fame really didn't, didn't crash Whitney and the fortune didn't really crash. Those were annoying things <laughs> for her. But the special love relationship, Jesus always says you have to be careful of this special love relationship because even if you're a wrestler like Andre the Giant, the ego will take you down. I mean the ego will take you down to the mat with the special love relationship. It knows that that's his most boasted gift. Just when you think you're going to escape fame, just when you think you're going to escape fortune and all the tricky, greedy things that the ego throws at you, it's going to try to kick you behind the legs and take you down to the mat with the special love relationship. Why would Jesus spend nine chapters on one thing unless it was important? He would not have spent nine chapters in the middle of his text telling us. Now with my friend Dorothy, she, she worked up in the Catskill Mountains. When I first met her, she was at uh, the Foundation for A Course in Miracles. And she, she worked in the garden and she worked the dishwasher and, and she also was the chef. She was like a chef in the kitchen. And when I was there, she told me one time that she said, whenever Ken Wapnick does those chapters I'm talking about, 15 to 24, whenever he does those chapters in a workshop, she has to order seven times as much food <laughs> to feed the participants. Why do, they, why do they need seven times the amount of food for those chapters? Is because the resistance to these ideas is absolutely enormous. If you think you're resistant to Vladimir Putin, you ain't seen nothing yet till you go down and face the ego with these ideas. Vladimir doesn't even stand, he's not even in the conversation with what we're going to do today. We're going, we're going deep dive. We're going to drop so deep today, we're going down the rabbit hole. We're just going to drop all the way through the rabbit hole. And of course, when we get down there, you may feel like you want to grab the chips and dip and put your camera on, <laughs> like Dorothy. <laughs> you, may, you may rush for the ice cream, the chocolate. <laughs> you, the ego might not be able to handle the truth. That, that's the famous line from Jack Nicholson. You can't handle the truth, but I'm telling you, you can handle the truth and leave your cameras on. I have fun watching your faces. That inspires me to do what I'm doing now when I see all your faces. And that that's part of the joy of this dive. We're diving in this together. We're doing this together. So, I showed the movie Whitney where she went from a happy, joyful, inspired young woman who had an angelic voice to drug addictions, a crazy, wild, special love relationship, and then she committed suicide. And people have trouble watching that, but you know, I don't think you, you have to really have trouble with it once you understand what the ego is doing to make you so sad that you would kill yourself. What 
The ego voice always wants you dead, but it's very tricky. It tries to trick you with idols and images in the world so that you can be placated, so that you can be distracted from the truth, so that you can seek false idols and then think that you're succeeding when in fact you're slip sliding away, as the Paul Simon <laughs> song and Simon and Garfunkel song. Now, I don't do this very often because it's not popular. People like comedies. This is not a comedy today. This is not a comedy. Uh, Whitney, Whitney, the movie Whitney was not a comedy. People had trouble. Turn it off. Stop it. Stop it. Don't show me that. Don't show me that. Well, let's, let's let Jesus show it to us. We can handle this. We're not, uh, we're not shy when it comes to spiritual awakening. So today I'm going to show you the newly released movie, The Mystery of Marilyn Monroe, The Unheard Tapes. Because most people know that Whit Whitney Houston was, the, was kind of like an iconic singer uh, who sang the song, The Greatest Love of All. But, but there are people that say Whitney Houston was the greatest singer of all time. <laughs> Her voice was uh, way, way, way beyond this world obviously. Um, and yet she committed suicide. Well, Marilyn Monroe, um, some of us don't know too much about Marilyn's childhood. We're going to find out in the movie today that she moved around from foster home to foster home. Uh, we're going to see that, that she had a very difficult uh, childhood and, and adolescence. Um, being a foster child, she was just pushed and moved around from foster home to foster home, so she didn't ever have a sense of family or a sense of love and connection when she was growing up. And we're also going to see that as she rose to great fame, as she became perhaps one of the most well-known sex symbols of all time, as she became known as a, as a, as a motion picture actress, she would sing in her motion pictures, she had charm, uh, and some of you have heard me on my other talks over the many, the last 30 years, how I said that Marilyn Monroe seemed to have everything that this world would say is, is necessary for success. She had fame, she had money, she had famous husbands, famous successful husbands, two of them. Um, she lived in a, a big, beautiful house in uh, Riverside, California. Um, she could travel around and move around because she was a movie star and, and the studios kind of took care of their movie stars. So basically she had everything that the world could offer. But remember who made this world? It was the ego who made this world. God didn't create this world. God creates in spirit. And so all those things that Marilyn seemed to have, that people sometimes uh, will even tell me that they're jealous of Marilyn Monroe. Like, whoa, you know, like, wow, that girl, she, she had it all. The only thing is that the all that she had was a projection of the ego. The mind is so powerful that it makes up concepts, like it makes up a body, it makes up a sexy body, it makes up a successful body, it gives the body skills and abilities, and it literally projects them out. So fame is not a concept in heaven. There is no such thing in the kingdom of heaven as something of fame. The ego made up fame, and you have to have an image to have fame. You see how the ego made the body, and then it it magnified that body and called it fame. So the ego projected fame onto Marilyn Monroe and, and of course in other characters in, in the dream. The ego projected popularity onto Marilyn Monroe. The ego projected wealth onto Marilyn Monroe. And the ego projected uh, motion picture success, many amazing uh, films. All of that was a projection because the world, as I've told you, is a projection of the ego. God didn't create this world. I, I seem to have to repeat that a few thousand times <laughs> and people always go, ooh, that's not what it says in the Bible. 
Who cares what it says in the Bible? I'm not interested in opinion. God did not create the world. If I have to rewrite the Bible on Genesis, I'll do it. If I have to rewrite the whole Bible, I already did. It's, it's called uh, Unwind Your Mind Back to God. But it may take a couple centuries before it catches on. But I'm not interested in how many centuries it takes before it catches on. <laughs> the Bible's already here and the presence of God is in us. And God did not create the world. God did not create fame, money, popularity, success. The, God did not create the body and God did not create sexy bodies. And God did not create ugly bodies because God did not create the body. God knows nothing of a body, not a single thing of a body. God is pure love and pure love cannot even look upon this dense vibrating matter that the ego made up that's called the body. <laughs> it's, God's not interested in bodies. So we have today the movie on Netflix, The Mystery of Marilyn Monroe, The Unheard Tapes. Now, we didn't really un know the whole story. You know, everybody's always said, oh, that was tragedy, you know, Marilyn Monroe committing suicide and taking multiple things. And But I think the only time anyone would even contemplate suicide sincerely or seriously is if they were very sad or they were very hurt or they were extremely um, offended in some extreme way uh, or maybe they were just sick and tired of this world. They, they, they were like, stop, let's stop this. I don't even know what's next, but the pain of what I'm experiencing now is so intense that, that that's where the ego comes in with its voice saying, yeah, just kill yourself. That's the ticket. That will help you. And we all know intuitively suicide is death. And Jesus tells us heaven is not reached through death. You reach life through life. And forgiveness is our version of, of life in this world. Forgiveness of illusions is actually the most happy vital experience we could have. We call it the atonement. Uh, the atonement is, is the Holy Spirit's uh, gift to us to help us escape from time and space and wake up to eternal life. So atonement would be the way, you know, if somebody puts on your gravestone, RIP, rest in peace, you don't go from just feeling terrible to just dying and then you're in eternal life. It would be so nice, you know, it's, oh, gee, all I have to do is kill myself. And they said, David, if, if it's true that I just have to die physically to be in heaven, then wouldn't everybody do mass suicide? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, let, let's get this over with as fast as possible. No, that's not it. Suicide is not the answer. Uh, and, and suicide is almost like taking a, a remote control and deciding to change the, change the channel. You've, you've been focused on one channel of illusion, you want to change the channel to another channel, uh, then that's, you know, suicide or getting hit by a bus are the same. <laughs> it's just a, a versions of changing the channel, you know. Uh, but, but suicide is not the answer. So it must be that, that if Marilyn Monroe had everything that the ego could offer and she still committed suicide, that it must be that maybe the Holy Spirit can use this story of Marilyn Monroe as a teaching device that will help us all. Because most of us haven't seemed to achieve the extremes of Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> it's not like we have our personality character being voted the sexiest woman alive. It's not like our personality character has appeared in movies with all these actors and actresses. It's not like our personality character was married to Joe DiMaggio as a Yankee Clipper. Uh, the famous Joe DiMaggio, yes, she was married to, to Joe. He was a nice guy, a great baseball player too. And she was married to Arthur Miller, who was a playwright, very good playwright. Death of a Salesman, you know, there's all kinds of famous plays that he, he wrote. Uh, but basically, um, what we're learning is that, that an attractive, successful, 
wonderful, in the world's terms, partner is not going to get you back to the kingdom of heaven. You've got to do the mind training. You've got to do the praying, the meditating, the listening to the guidance. You have to do all the things that all the mystics and saints have had to do to reach higher states. Look at, Ma look at uh, Mary Magdala, for example. Mary Magdala lived at the time of Jesus and she was from the town of Magdala and her father and her brother wanted her to get married like that was the thing for women back in the day. You know, you, you do what you do, you're helpful, you wash the laundry, you do the food stuff and da 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 and then eventually you get a husband and you bear children and you keep the, the, the family lineage going. You keep the you keep the you keep the Jewish nation going. You you know back in the day you know that's part of procreation. You know keep the Jewish nation going. That doesn't get you to the kingdom of heaven. That's that's part of the distraction from the kingdom of heaven. Time, everything of time is keeping you from the holy instant, from waking up now to the kingdom of heaven. So everything the ego made is just for one reason to keep you blind from knowing who you are, to keep you blinded in the darkness from the light. Because if you knew that light, you would rush to God in gratitude and thankfulness for that divine light. So, as usual, you know, you, you gave me some themes to work with. The, the first theme that you have, that you voted this number one with 60 votes, it was Falling into dependency traps versus rising up my self as spirit. Falling into dependency traps versus rising up my capital self, my Christ self as, as spirit, as, as one with God. Wow, that's, that's it. Wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be wonderful to be free of all false dependencies? You know, everybody's like, well, I would like to do this, but I, but I don't want to upset my mom, or I don't want to upset my dad. My family would be very upset if I go for spirituality. What are you going to do for a job? What are you going to do for a career? Oh, divine prom providence. I'm, gonna, I'm channeling Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And that's when the parents get really worried, like, oh my God, we have failed. <laughs> I was supposed to raise a good upstanding citizen, taxpaying, contributing to society, and now they, they got their hands like this and they're like channeling Jesus and, and writing things down from Jesus and following their inner guidance and following their intuition. That's a nightmare for most mothers and fathers. Absolute nightmare. <laughs> they, they feel like they've their whole life is wasted because <laughs> their offspring is now turned all nirvana. <laughs> it's like, come on. <laughs> they probably were listening to the band Nirvana. Now they're in Nirvana and they're going toward Nirvana and the parents are pulling their hair out going, oh my God, I blew it. I totally blew it. So, just for a little help, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about this dependency word. Let's talk about dependency. Dependency is not, it doesn't have a good connotation in this world. If if somebody asks you on a job interview, what are your strengths? And you say, dependency. <laughs> Out the door. <laughs> you lose the job. <laughs> and then so it nobody likes the word dependency. And then let's use codependency. That that is a word that's used to describe relationships, codependency. That's not a good word either. If you if you go to a therapist and the therapist listens to you wail away and as you cry and scream and kick for a few years and then finally the therapist goes, hmm, I think we have some codependency issues <laughs> going on here. And you go, oh, please don't use that word. <laughs> please don't. I know I was raised in a dysfunctional family, but please don't call me codependent. So nobody wants to be dependent and nobody wants to be codependent. Here's another word I'll throw out for you. Independent. Oh, now that one feels better. You see, people like that. Like the, the Declaration of Independence. 
I am woman, hear me roar, into numbers too big to ignore. Or, I'm an independent male, I am the divine masculine, I am independent. Listen, independent and codependent and dependence are all invented by, guess who? The ego. That's right. There's no independence in heaven except creation. Jesus says, God created you perfect and you have an independence in creation. In spirit, you're independent. That's the good version. All on earth. Mm -mm -mm. Independence is autonomy. It's just as, as, as difficult. It's just as much of a defense against love as codependence and dependence. So the ego doesn't care which of its three tricks you will fall for. It doesn't care if you call yourself codependent or dependent or independent. The ego is laughing if you identify with any of these characteristics because why? They're all time characteristics. They have nothing to do with eternal spirit. So even if you say, oh, on the Enneagram, I'm this number and I'm very independent. Listen, you don't want to be on that Enneagram. I, I actually had an Enneagram expert one time. I was invited to speak at an Enneagram conference one time when I was in Colombia. And I spoke about, you know, awakening from the dream. And they all loved it too. But when somebody who was an Enneagram expert, they said, David, do you know what number you are? I was quite aware that I was none of the numbers. <laughs> so I, I told the Enneagram expert, I'm none of them. And he said, no. All human beings are, are one of the numbers. And I said, okay, you don't like my answer, I'm none of them. I'm all of them. <laughs> that was that one work. <laughs> none of them, all of them, you know. There's no middle ground. This course will be believed entirely or not at all. You are never a number. Uh, unless you want to consider yourself one with God. That's, that's not bad, but <laughs> I don't think that's a number. I think that's a reality. <laughs> that's not a number. That's a reality. So, First thing is, let's take a look at this whole thing about uh, dependency. Because our, our number one theme is falling into dependency traps versus rising up myself as spirit. Here's what Jesus has to say. He says, except you become as little children means that unless you fully recognize your complete dependence on God, you cannot know the real power of the Son in his true relationship with the Father. So Jesus is flipping the ego's word, dependency, and now he's flipping it back to God. And he's saying, be totally dependent on God, like all the mystics and saints. Just listen to one voice, the Holy Spirit. Be dependent on the Holy Spirit for all your needs. For everything that you believe you need in this world, be dependent on the Holy Spirit. I see Micah, Amanda on over there. They, Jesus has given them a house. He's given them a whole house overlooking the water. And all they had to do was leave behind everything else in the world and then they get a nice house in Spain. And it was owned by the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church is giving it over to Three people that are into A Course in Miracles. You see how Jesus is having fun with the Catholic Church now. He's got, they're going to be in a beautiful church-owned property because they're dependent on God. You see the difference? Not dependent on jobs, not dependent on careers, not dependent on countries, not dependent on theologies and ideologies, but just really simply dependent on God. You follow the Holy Spirit, everything you need is provided. Carol's there. Carol's working on a movie with Jesus. And all he's asking you to do is let, Jesus is saying, let me make the movie and you'll have some fun. But if you think you're Carol and you're going to use your past learning on this movie, <laughs> going to be a riding a wild bronco. But you see, that's because God dependence is what it's all about. It's all about listening and following the Holy Spirit. 
Nothing has any meaning except listening and following the Holy Spirit. The world has no meaning except listening and following the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, most of the loftier concepts of which you are capable now are time dependent. So, you know, maybe you have certain things that you are aspiring to. Maybe you want to be a spiritual success story and you have some image of what that would look like, a guru or something. Or maybe you want to be altruistic and you want to make a lot of money so you can be a philanthropist and give a lot of money away. Uh, or maybe you want to be a healer. You want to have bodies come to you and walk away out the door. I'm healed as they run down the hill. You think, oh, that's good. I'm a good healer. These are, again, most of the loftier concepts of which you are capable now are time dependent. So, that's why the Holy Spirit has to work with the concepts in the mind to help loosen the mind from all of them. And you'll get certain concepts as you go along. Maybe to be a healer. Maybe to be a speaker. Maybe to be uh, even a miracle worker is a, is a human concept, but it's the more you go into what it actually is, the human part disappears and you find that you are a miracle of God. <laughs> Your identity is a miracle. I'm not talking about the body either or the personality. You start to go, oh my God, what if I'm a miracle of God? You know, you see how it, it, it has to go through the rinsing away of the concepts. But most of the loftier concepts of which you believe you are capable now are time dependent. Trying to think of an example, like, um, let's say, um, let's say you're you're uh, a very generous person, like a philanthropist, or maybe another one would be um, that that you're you're a light worker in the world. Light worker is still a human concept, because in the end, the light it just is. It doesn't work. <laughs> It, uh, light doesn't work. <laughs> it just is. But if you're a light worker, it means you're just letting the Holy Spirit come through you, your mind to be used in a way that helps bring light by you recognizing yourself as the light. As I am the light of the world. And then you bring that light with you. Okay. Your whole creative function lies in your complete dependence on God, whose function He shares with you. That's from chapter 11. The belief in ego autonomy is costing you the knowledge of your dependence on God in which your freedom lies. So much for autonomy, you know, I, I see people that, are, that really practice spirituality so deeply and they, they free themselves up from being codependent. And they free themselves up from being dependent on on people and places and things and the government for handouts. They free themselves up, they free themselves up, but then the ego snaps and hooks them with the autonomy idea. Because they think, I am an autonomous, powerful person. I am an individual, unique expression of the love of God. I am a powerful person. I'm a power man, a power woman. And the ego is laughing, going, gotcha with the autonomy. <laughs> you gave up the codependence and the dependence, but wow, I got you easy. Pride, vanity, hooks them every time. <laughs> so, that's right. You, you have to be humble. You have to lay aside all self-concepts, including the autonomy one. Because the ego knows that it invented the body and it knows that that the mind will be tricked with one concept called freedom of the body. You see how sneaky that is? And then Jesus comes in and says, what do you want? Freedom of the body or freedom of the mind for both you cannot have. Ho ho! Jesus is going to try to pull ropes out on one of the ego's biggest traps. It's going to try to re- Jesus will just pull that right out from under you. And everybody knows that the saints all went for the stillness. Uh, actually, like Paramahansa Yogananda, he could not, he could care less of being famous because his real draw was into samadhi. <laughs> you see, 
a famous guru is nothing compared to samadhi, the state of mind. So, so Paramahansa Yogananda is a symbol of he just let himself just ease into the stillness and, and toward the end of his life he would go into such deep samadhi states that his, his disciples, his, his, uh, his monks, his followers would get scared because he was still breathing but <laughs> he didn't move for a long time. That's because he was going into samadhi. The body was not necessary to be moving, but they started to freak. And then he would just say, kind of just whisper this word into my ear or blow on me. If you get too scared, blow on me. I'll come out for you just to calm you down a little bit. But I'm going back. <laughs> I, the world I see holds nothing that I want. So you see, that's a big difference between trying to be a famous guru. The, the, the real essence of, of divinity is just to be one with God. And you care less about the world, the images. You don't care about fame, money, you don't care about followers, you don't care about anything of the world because they're all time concepts and you're not interested in time. Okay. Now, here's your second theme. It's taken me a while. Usually I rattle right through the five themes, but this is your second theme. I'm trying to give you a good setup because I, I know that if we're doing a root canal, you need this setup. This is, this is the preparation for the root canal. I, I'm doing this as a preparation for where we're going today. Because without this, you're, you're, it's going to be uncomfortable. You need to have some, some truth ideas in your mind swirling around uh, for today's journey. Okay, second one. This is the second uh, the second theme, seeking love outside my capital self versus knowing that I am enough. You might just say, I am. <laughs> seeking love outside myself versus knowing that I am enough. Here's what Jesus has to say in the Course. Seek not outside yourself, for it will fail and you will weep each time an idol falls. Heaven cannot be found where it is not. And there can be no peace excepting there. Each idol that you worship when God calls will never answer in his place. There is no other answer you can substitute and find the happiness his answer brings. Seek not outside yourself, for all your pain comes simply from a futile search of what you want, insisting where it must be found. So when we seek for happiness in the world, it always falls apart. The wheels fall off at some point. Be you glad that you are told where happiness abides and seek no longer elsewhere. You will fail. But it is given you to know the truth and not to seek for it outside yourself. And then one more time, he, he really likes this, this theme. Seek not outside yourself. The search implies that you are not whole within and fear to look upon your devastation, but prefer to seek outside yourself for what you are. Whenever we look for worthiness in terms of the body, in terms of the skills of the body, in terms of the accomplishments in the world of the body, whatever your resume says. Uh, if Whenever you try to look at history in the past and somebody puts you down and you say, hey, you know who you're talking to? Do you see my resume? Do you know who you're talking to? You know, Jesus is like, I'm not interested in the resume. That was the first thing that Jesus had me delete after 10 years of university. I thought he was going to take me into the magical world of manifesting or something, learn how to be a, a manifester. Jesus is like, no, actually not. Delete your resume. Do you know how hard I worked? Delete it right now. I'm going to lead you now. You don't need the resume. Your, your resume is of no use to me now, because I will guide you step by step. And that was, that was a big turning point for me. I just deleted it. Of course, I, I, I deleted it from my word processor. Back then we didn't have computers, we had word processors. And um, 
first I threw all of my resumes in the trash can and I put them out in the garbage. And then Jesus said, no, I meant delete it from your word processor. You get rid of the image of the thing. <laughs> I don't even want to see that image around. Uh, don't You can just print more. <laughs> you keep that hidden in your word processor. Get it out of there. It's off of your word processor. You're mine now. I'm going to use you now in ways you can't even imagine. So if you want to, if you're saying, yes, Lord, I will follow you, then that means you follow the instructions. And the first one was delete the resume. So here's the big one too. This is the, the third one that you have in here with 40 votes. It says, believing in loss, betrayal, and rejection. In the end, this is important we look at this because Marilyn Monroe is going to symbolize a deep unconscious belief in rejection. And she's going to seem to be betrayed and rejected in her childhood, in her teen years, and then when she gets married to Joe DiMaggio. She's just out having fun, doing a movie, her, the wind blows up under her skirt, her legs are showing in front of everybody that's gathered there in New York City. Well, that's the end of that, that marriage. <laughs> because because of an expectation from a husband that no my wife is 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 an ex exhibitionist it's all right that she's the sex symbol of the whole world but she shouldn't be on the streets of new york filming a film and what could she help it the the wind blew under her dress <laughs> that's the end of that marriage and then she'll marry a famous playwright but she's going to believe that she's rejected from her family, believes that she's rejected from foster homes, then she's going to believe that she's rejected from the first husband, and then she's going to believe she's rejected from the second husband, and then before she kills herself, she's going to be, believe she's rejected from two more men. And they seem to be pretty prominent men. John F. Kennedy, the President of the United States, and his younger brother, Bobby. And that rejection is going to bring such heartbreak into her that she's going to kill herself. But that's not a tragedy unless you start to see that it's just the belief that set the whole thing up. It's just the belief that she was not the Christ. It's just a belief that there were these famous uh, authority figures and famous characters, famous men that could reject her. And what Jesus is saying is, the secret of salvation is but this, you are doing this to yourself. You are choosing to believe in the ego, and the ego is the belief in death. It is the belief in betrayal. It is the belief in rejection. It is the belief in abandonment. And people aren't doing it to you. The, the movie is being acted out so you can see with the Holy Spirit that you're none of it. That you're the Christ. You're the I am presence. You aren't in this dream at all. You're just dreaming a dream of separation, of abandonment, betrayal, rejection. I know all of us have gone through those emotions. Those, those are the ones that hurt the most. Abandonment, betrayal, rejection. There's nothing that cuts like a knife in our heart, like a twisting knife. When you believe that you know somebody, you trust somebody, somebody's a dear friend, and then they seem to betray you, they're doing you a favor. They're just acting out the belief in betrayal so you can cast it out of your mind. When you have a grievance, Jesus says, pluck the offense from your mind. Let the Holy Spirit pluck it from your mind. Don't blame your brothers and sisters. They're not doing anything wrong. They're just helping you by acting it out. You know, like Shakespeare said, all the world's a stage and everyone must play their part. And and we, we should feel grateful for every part that's being played because it's helping us mirror to us what we still believe in our unconscious mind. And we couldn't even see it unless they acted it out. So we should stop and give them bravo, Oscar, to you. That was the most vicious, wicked dream character I've ever seen. I made it up, but thank you for showing me. <laughs> that I made it up, you know. I needed you to act it out so I could see that I believed in it first. Because we can't perceive it unless we believe it. You got to believe it first before you can perceive it. And if you believe in forgiveness, you'll see a happy dream, I guarantee you. You'll see a happy dream if you believe it. 
But if you just say, oh, maybe some, maybe in 10 lifetimes, you know, I'll get there and this and that. I know there's some teachers that even teach you cannot hear the, the Holy Spirit's voice. Don't believe it. If anybody tells you you can't hear the Holy Spirit's voice, don't believe it. Because if you believe it, then you'll seem to go, I can't hear. Why can't I hear? I say, well, look at the signs and symbols all around you. But I want to hear it. Well, if you, if you want to hear it is, you'll receive it. <laughs> Just if you really want to hear it, you will hear it. There's nothing that can stop you from hearing it. Because that's the only voice that makes sense. That's your voice of sanity, your voice of happiness. If a teacher tells you you will never hear the Holy Spirit's voice, don't you believe it for one second. Because you, that is the most natural voice there is. And it's, even though it's rare, is rare going to stop you? You know, if, if, if it's rare, that's not going to stop you. Okay, it's rare. I'm still going to hear it. I don't care if it's rare. I don't care if my steak is coming off the grill rare. I'm still going to eat it. And I don't care if you tell me it's rare to hear the Holy Spirit. I'm still going to hear it because I want to. And my mind is powerful. Okay. Here's, here's, we're talking about uh, belief in loss, betrayal, rejection. Here's what Jesus says. Find hope and comfort rather than despair in this. You could not long find even the illusion of love in any special relationship here. For you are no longer wholly insane and you would soon recognize the guilt of self-betrayal for what it is. So every time you think you're in this perfect romantic relationship and you think, there is a God, oh my God, Jesus gave me my soulmate, don't stop there because as long as it's personal or interpersonal, it's not the final goal. It's, it's like there's still self-betrayal. And that's why don't be shocked when you're with your soulmate and your anger comes up. <laughs> because that's the purpose of the soulmate is to once in a while act out the rage that's still buried down there so that you can release the rage. You see how that's an important function. Most people don't like that. That ruins the story. They say, David, you are ruining every fairy tale that I've ever had. Good. It, they need to be ruined. <laughs> if You need to actually see that Cinderella and the Prince is just a good starting point. You know, it's better to be a, a prince than a, than a frog. Maybe. They're really, in, in the real world, they're the same. But but it, it's a step, you know, okay, you can be this prince, but then Jesus says, yeah, but that's still an opportunity to, to find your own self-betrayal, which is in your unconscious mind, you see? So don't get fooled by the form, because it's just a step along the way. The Jesus says this, the betrayal of the Son of God lies only in illusions, and all of his, quote, sins are but his own imagining. His reality is forever sinless. He need not be forgiven, but awakened. In his dreams he has betrayed himself, his brothers, and his God. Yet what is done in dreams has not been really done. It is impossible to convince the dreamer that this is so, for dreams are what they are because of their illusion of reality. You wouldn't even give a thought to your nighttime dreams if there wasn't a part of your mind that believed, hmm, wow, if that happened to me, that could be upsetting. <laughs> That's what a nightmare is. A nightmare is a fantasy generated by the ego to scare you into re believing in a body. You know, it's like, ooh, ooh. It's trying to scare you into staying asleep. And nightmares, we don't wake up with nightmares. We wake up with happy dreams. We wake up with forgiveness dreams. We wake up with dreams of non-judgment. Okay, the final 
Well, there's two more left. Seeking approval from others versus knowing that I am complete already. The one emotion in which substitution is impossible is love. Fear involves substitution by definition for its, it is love's replacement. So in other words, there was just heaven and God. As soon as there was the belief in separation, then the Holy Spirit was created as an answer to the belief in separation. So the Holy Spirit only came into existence as a bridge when there seemed to be the belief in separation. Does that make sense? If there's if there's no separation, why do you need a bridge? <laughs> it's a, all is one, all is love. But as soon as there was a belief in separation, the Holy Spirit was created instantly as the answer to that belief. And it took the Holy Spirit one less than one second to handle the cosmos. It was solved the instant it was it projected. So the Holy Spirit's pretty quick. Now Listening to the Holy Spirit when you believe in illusions can seem to take time because there's a lot of resistance to that voice voice for love. Fear is both a fragmented and fragmenting emotion. Fear, it seems to take many forms and each one seems to require a different form of acting out for satisfaction. While this appears to introduce quite variable behavior, a far more serious effect lies in the fragmented perception from which the behavior stems. So in other words, Jesus is saying, don't be too concerned what the bodies are doing. It's your mind and it's the distorted perception and the distorted belief in your mind that's producing this distortion. Don't be concerned about what bodies are doing or not doing. Look at the, the motives and the meanings and the, the, the values that your mind is giving to the body. Remember recently I was saying the body is nothing more than a learning device. Remember I was using this thing, it's like, oh yeah, learning device. Le learning devices don't make mistakes. It's the mind that tells the le learning device what to be. So let's imagine this is Marilyn Monroe. Now I know you're going to say, David, that's a very poor representation. It's not quite as curvy as it could be. But I'm just using it. It's a learning device. That's what Marilyn's body was, was a learning device, right? It's the same as everybody. It's the same as this pen. So this is Marilyn. Now the ego is like, ooh, fame. Ooh, ooh. sex appeal. Ooh, ooh. Uh, popularity. Ooh, ooh. Money. Ooh, ooh. Wow, you've got it all. You Are you happy? No. Okay. How about a famous husband? <laughs> Joe DiMaggio. <laughs> are you happy now? No. Okay. Let's get uh, Arthur Miller in here. Ooh, ooh. Kissy, kissy, kissy. Arthur values you for your, your mind too, not just your body. No. She's not smart enough. Oh no. Oh no. You see, these learning devices are not the problem. The problem isn't with the body. The problem isn't with the personality. It's the mind that is reading meaning into these characters. The mind is saying you're a body. The mind is saying you're a famous body. You're a famous actress. You're a famous icon. You're a sex appeal. You're the sexiest woman in the history of the, of the world. You know. You know, you see how the ego is just re reading meaning onto this little learning device. It's like, this would be like you doing this to your pen. And, and then if your cat was in the same room or your dog, they would look at you like, bonkers. <laughs> my, my pet owner is Looney Tunes. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're chasing all kinds of false values and they're projecting them onto the bodies, you know, and it's they're not going to be happy. So we need to have this context when you watch this movie today. Otherwise, you'll be sad. You'll be sad if you don't remember that the body of Marilyn Monroe is just a learning device and learning devices don't make mistakes. The mistakes are totally judgments and evaluations in the mind, the ego mind.
the wrong mind. Not your right mind. Your right mind is happy. Your The Holy Spirit lives in your right mind, so why not live there with the Holy Spirit? <laughs> why, why not... Why not take up residence in your right mind with the Holy Spirit and have a good laugh at the whole thing instead of going into the wrong mind. Oh, I'm sorry for what I said. I'm sorry for what I did. I think the body is more than a learning device. I think it's me. <laughs> and I think this me made did terrible decisions, wrong behaviors. And Jesus is like, come on. You, you are not listening to me. The body is a learning device for the mind to wake up. It's your mind that wakes up. Everybody's arguing about who's, which bodies woke up and who woke up first. I'll tell you now, no bodies have ever woken up because bodies are projections of the ego. <laughs> they don't have minds of their own. They don't have their own private thoughts either and they don't even wake up or fall asleep. They act like they fall asleep at night. But that's an act. <laughs> the ego is projecting even sleep. The ego projects sleep onto the body. Oh, look, it's the sleeping body. Oh, it's awake. It's lively. Oh, it's asleep. You see, that's all just false projections. The mind is making the whole thing up. This is lesson number two from the workbook. I have given everything I see all the meaning it has for me. I have given every body I see all the meaning it has for me. I have given every cat and dog, every mountain, every tree, all the meaning that it has for me. Oh my God, that's profound. Well, maybe I should roll back to lesson number one. Nothing I see means anything. <laughs> in other words, God is the only reality, so there's nothing in perception that, that has any meaning. That's what spiritual awakening is about. Okay, we made it down to the last one. Believing that I am a victim versus seeing I am not the victim of the world I see. Oh, you, you only gave it 31 votes. Oh, you don't like this victim one. <laughs> you, coming in at number five is, <laughs> is victim and abuse. Okay, and Jesus does tell us he says this is the ego's core teaching is that the ego is telling you that you are a victim of somebody, somebody else or somebody, something else. He says this is what the ego's entire teaching is. So if you can hear the insanity of what I'm going to read to you, then you're becoming sane. But you have to be able to hear what I'm going to read to you that Jesus is saying is the ego's core teaching. And if you can see that it's it's not true, then you're you're happy. You can't you can't be stopped. Your happiness cannot be stopped. So here it is. This is from text chapter 31. He's he's waited 31 chapters to tell you the ego's core teaching. And here it is. I am the thing you made of me. And as you look on me, you stand condemned because of what I am. On this conception of the self, the small self, the world smiles with approval. The ego smiles with approval. For it guarantees the pathways of the world are safely kept and those who walk on them will not escape. So I'll, I'll read it to you again. I am the thing you made of me. And as you look on me, you stand condemned because of what I am. That is so deep that some of you might be saying, can you just give me one example, David, of that? Because it's, I'm having trouble uh, digesting that. I am the thing you made of me, and as you look on me, you stand condemned because of what I am. I'll give you an example. There's a teenager, the teenager is so frustrated, so angry, so bored with school, with everything of this world, that, that uh, the, the teenager says to his parents, I think I'm just gonna, gonna kill myself. Are you happy with that? And that is an example of, I am, the thing you made of me. Like, you you birthed me. 
into this wacky, crazy nightmare world. You birthed me into this world. Now, uh, I'm just, if I kill myself, will that make you happy? Like you brought me here and now look what the world did to me. So, uh, you know, are you, are you going to be happy if I take myself out of the world? That's kind of an extreme example of the ego's thinking. That's a suicidal example, like, you brought me here, how dare you? <laughs> how dare you bring me into this nightmare world? <laughs> I'll get back at you, I'll just kill myself. You see, that's the crazy logic of the ego, but that's an extreme example of what this is teaching here. A smaller example would be when you, when you give your mother or your father a lecture on what they didn't give you <laughs> as a child. You didn't give me enough love. You didn't give me enough care. You didn't, you didn't buy me an iPhone. <laughs> this is a modern version. <laughs> How could you not buy me an iPhone? Every other student in, in the school has an iPhone and I have air, nothing to put in my hands. You see, that's, this is part of the you were not a good enough parent scenario. But, but underneath you were not a good enough parent is, here it is. I am the thing you made of me, and as you look on me, you stand condemned because of what I am. You see? It's a blame game. The ego, this that's its game. Blame the parents. Blame the culture. Blame the politicians. Blame the neighbor. Blame your brother and sister. You see, this is a blame game. The ego is a blame game. And the only way you're going to be happy is to give up the blame game. You have to take 100% responsibility for your state of mind. And as soon as that little ego starts to come in there and starts to say, well, they didn't really treat you very well, and well, they could have done this better, and they should have done this, and could have, would have, should have, blah, 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 blah. Don't listen to it. That ego is trying to get you to blame the world. And then Jesus he never leaves us there. He tells us the escape. Here's Jesus giving us the escape. You are the dreamer of the world of dreams. No other cause does it have. It has, or, nor ever will. Nothing more than a fearful, idle dream has terrified God's Son and made him think that he has lost his innocence, denied his father, and made war upon himself. So fearful is the dream, so seeming real, he could not waken to reality without the sweat of terror and a scream of mortal fear unless a gentler dream preceded his awakening and allowed his, his calmer mind to welcome, not to fear, the voice that calls with love to waken him. A gentler dream in which his suffering was healed and where his brother was his friend. God willed he waken gently and with joy and gave him means to waken without fear. So he's saying, please accept this soft, gentle dream that the Holy Spirit is offering. Please just stay with me, Jesus is saying. Just look at the world with me and see how soft it is. See how gentle it is. See how kind it is. In forgiving eyes, the world is, is so kind. And you can look upon any sight through the kindness of your own mind, through, through forgiveness. And then, here's a paragraph that will save you every time you think you've been wronged. Every time you think you've been abused, mistreated, Every time you feel nobody recognizes your true worth or you've been not appreciated, here is your paragraph that will save you. This is, it doesn't get any better than this. This is so soft. Imagine Jesus telling you this right now. Dream softly of your sinless brother who unites with you in holy innocence. And from this dream, the Lord of heaven will himself awaken his beloved son. Dream of your brother's kindnesses instead of dwelling in your dreams on his mistakes. Select his thoughtfulness 
to dream about instead of counting up the hurts he gave. Forgive him his illusions and give thanks to him for all the helpfulness he gave. And do not brush aside his many gifts because he is not perfect in your dreams. If your brother and your sister were perfect in your dreams, you don't have to dream anymore. <laughs> there's, there's no, you don't even have to forgive because if, if your brothers and sisters become perfect in your dreams, you're home in heaven. <laughs> you, don't, you don't need bodies anymore. <laughs> you, don't need, you don't need to be dreaming once your brother and sister are perfect. In fact, all it takes is one brother or sister. You know, some of you, I see you at La Casa de Milagros looking around at Living Miracles Monastery, Micah, Amanda, just turn around and look at each other and just realize all you have to do is see one per person as perfect, which means see beyond their body. <laughs> And, and you'll just smile, your final smile on earth. <laughs> you won't be here long because you'll be so happy, you'll be like, Oh, sweetie. Oh, you adorable one. Oh my gosh, was I mistaken in you. You are just so loving. I can't, oh, I can't stand it. You're so beautiful. You know, that, that's, that's where this is going. It's because Jesus knows that, that who we are is spirit. We're not bodies. <laughs> so he's like saying, just forgive one. <laughs> That's all it takes. <laughs> he's not even asking you to forgive 7.8 billion. He's just, just practice with one. Practice with one. But do it all the way. You know, go all the way with it. So, and finally, um, I, I, I came across <laughs> this thing in the course. Some of you can probably, I'll show it to you, then I'll read it. Uh, this is what I came across in the course today. I don't know if you can see it there. I'll read it to you. It says, this course does not attempt to take from you the little that you have. It does not try to substitute utopian ideas for satisfactions which the world contains. There are no satisfactions in the world. There are no satisfactions in the world. Believe this one thought and you are indescribably happy. Because you see, if you believe that one thought, then you can let the past and the future go, right? What else would you need <laughs> time for if you believe that one thought? You see, that's, that's, Jesus is so good. He's so wise. He so is reaching us with all this freedom. Believe this one thought. There are no satisfactions in the world. So you see, Jesus is finally answering Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones, who sang, I can't get no satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction. And I've tried, and I've tried, and I've tried, and I've tried. I can't get no. <laughs> He's actually answering the Rolling Stones. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ is answering the Rolling Stones with, there are no satisfactions in the world. That's why Mick could not get satisfactions. He had, he had a lot of girlfriends, he had drugs, he had rock and roll. Could not satisfy Mick. Even with rock and roll, Mick was not satisfied. So now we're ready for Marilyn, Marilyn Monroe. If you can, if you can now go past Mick Jagger. <laughs> Mick was kind of famous, but not Marilyn Monroe. She's gonna free. She's gonna pop the cap off of this lid today for us. So sit back and enjoy the ride, uh, because we're going to look at the lifetime of Marilyn Monroe and we're, we're doing it for the purpose of freeing the whole universe. Because 
Jesus knows we need extreme teaching examples. That's why the crucifixion, uh, the whole story of him going on the cross was an extreme teaching example in which he taught, teach only love for that is what you are. And that's, that's an extreme teaching example that you can't kill the Christ. But now we're going to let Marilyn Monroe show us that the world we see holds nothing that we want. We don't, you know, Marilyn, you know, she just had what, what the world would call a natural sex appeal and she used lipstick and she used makeup and and even in A Course in Miracles, uh, Jesus uses those kind of metaphors. He said, would you put lipstick on, on a skeleton and dress it up? That's in the Course. Jesus is poking fun at our learning devices. Why are you putting the lipstick on? Why are you, oh that low, are you trying to attract another body's eyes with what you're doing with this learning device? Well, you're offering them a crown of thorns if you're doing that. Next time you think about dressing the body up to attract another body's eyes, Jesus says, mm, yes, you're offering him a crown of thorns. You're actually offering guilt as an attraction. And I will talk about uh, that. I will talk about the attraction of guilt as we get into this movie because for most people they say, I don't, I'm not attracted to guilt. I don't want guilt. Guilt is not my goal, but unconsciously we have to look at the attraction of guilt because that's what keeps the mind trapped into the body identification. So enjoy the movie. I, I'm glad I gave you a good setup here. So I think you will enjoy this movie now. Uh, I hope it'll be a nice, a nice joyful uh, flight and you don't have to, there's, there's Zach, or there, there's Grace and Vanessa over there in, in Spain. You look pretty happy. There's, there's Barrett. Okay. Enjoy the movie. See you soon. So that's good advice for all of us. Uh, he, he was trying to uncover what happened with Marilyn Monroe and then he was getting all these blocks and dead ends and then he said, I did what you have to do. I went back to the beginning. And Jesus is saying right now to all of us, that's what we have to do together. Jesus is saying, let's go back to the beginning of the ego. <laughs> don't, don't be trying to deal with the effects of the ego. Because when you try to deal with the effects of the ego, you're not getting to the cause. And the cause of the ego is a belief in the mind. So you need instructions, you need directions on forgiveness, on how to go so deep down the rabbit hole of your mind, so deep into that unconscious part, because the unconscious mind is projecting the world that you see. The surface of the self-concept that you call your personality self is just a tiny piece of the self-concept and the world that you perceive is the other part. The part that the world is, is and the body is what you, you basically gave away. And, and basically you can't see the first part of the self-concept. You can't see the ego. I mean, everybody in the world is just trying to do the best they can based on what they believe. Even Vladimir Putin, he's just trying to protect and defend Mother Russia as he defines Mother Russia. You see? He's just trying to protect, just like a, an animal, a bird might protect its little chickadee, its little baby bird. And all animals seem to protect they're young. And, and everybody, even the villains, even Saddam Hussein, he was doing the best that he could for what he believed about himself and, and Iran, Iraq. Uh, Putin's doing the same. Everyone is just acting out unconscious beliefs. And what Jesus is saying, we have to go back to the beginning. We have to go back to that original belief in separation. Because Jesus knows it didn't happen. <laughs> he's, he's got a really good view. He knows that the separation never happened. And now he has to teach us 
how to dive deep into the mind and accept the the correction to realize that that it never happened. God didn't create the ego. Separation never happened because God didn't create it. But if you believe in it, you experience the world and its effects as if it really happened. Fear is not real, but if you believe in it, you'll perceive it. Guilt is not real, but if you believe in it, you'll perceive it. Death is not real, but if you believe in it, you'll perceive it. And war is not real, but if you believe in it, you will perceive it in awareness. It's not eternal, it doesn't last forever, so it's not real, but it's an illusion, it's a figment of imagination that's being produced by the ego. So I like this part where this this investigative uh, journalist from Ireland is, he's come all the way to Hollywood to try to find out, to kind of solve the mystery around Marilyn Monroe's death. And Jesus is saying, I, yeah, I want you to do the same. Come with me into your mind and let's unravel the mystery of the ego and let me show you that it's not real. That's, that's a pretty deep journey. That's the greatest journey you're, you could ever go on is this journey. And of course, it's, it has its difficulties, because the ego is along for the ride, <laughs> trying to stop you <laughs> at every turn, because the ego doesn't want to be exposed, and, and the ego doesn't want to be seen as nothing. It wants, to, it wants you to believe in it. It wants to, you to use the power of your mind to keep it going, to perpetuate it. But it's already been solved. It's already been handled. Ah. Now we're really getting down there with what is the ego up to? So, the ego invents the body. Here we have Marilyn again. I know some of you are like, oh, it's hard for me to imagine this, but remember, the body's just a learning device. Just a learning device. Learning devices are not beautiful or ugly because beauty Beautiful forms and ugly forms are invented by, guess who? The ego. God is just pure love. God doesn't know about beautiful forms and ugly forms. So here we have our little learning device, and she's starting out, and she's, she's going to the movie theaters as a teenager, and she's watching, can't get her out of the movie theater. She's watching, watching all the movie stars, movie stars. The one she likes the most has white hair. She goes... I need that kind of white hair. Blonde. <laughs> and then she, we can see that the ego invented love, it invented the body, it invented sex, it invented fame. And you can see how the ego uses fame and sex and money and the body all for its purpose of building an attractive personality. This is what Jesus is talking about, about a substitute for love. The ego is trying to build something in this world that is so attractive you would never doubt it. You would never go beyond it. And so, we could say thousands, tens of thousands, millions of little girls growing up, they see the Marilyn Monroe and go, ooh. That's nice. <laughs> I want to be like that. But it's the ego, the ego that brings about the desire for sexuality. Jesus says in The Course in Miracles that, that sexual impulses or physical impulses are distorted miracle impulses. You see how tricky that is. God didn't invent distorted miracle impulses. God sends the miracle impulses into your mind to wake up, to remember that you're the Christ. But when those miracle impulses come through the dark lens of the ego, they come out on the surface of consciousness as distorted miracle impulses. So the craving for sex is really the craving for God. The craving for food is really the craving for God. The, the craving for mobility, it's still the craving for God. The craving for success is really the craving for God. But the ego has its own invented 
concept of success, its own invented concept. There we have it. All the tapes are showing that the, the ones who control Hollywood, mostly are the, the wealthy men, um, they see the value in making money um, using the bodies of the attractive women. Jane Russell, uh, Marilyn Monroe, these are like called pinup girls during the wars. They would pass around, all the soldiers would pass around their pinup girls. You know, what it is, is the ego is using the, the mechanisms of this world, the body and all the mechanisms, to make a covering for itself so that you will never see the belief that's underneath. You see how sneaky it is? It uses fame which God did not create. It uses sexuality and, and sex appeal which God did not create, of course, because God didn't create the body. Uh, it, it uses the glitz and glamour, you know, diamonds are a girl's best friend. Well, there you have it, a beautiful woman in a beautiful dress, wearing a bunch of diamonds and singing the song, diamonds are the, the girls are a girl's best friend, but diamonds are rocks. They're just shiny rocks. <laughs> I'm sorry, the kingdom of heaven, you don't reach the kingdom of heaven by chasing after rocks or different shapes or different uh, things that money can buy. You know, money buys big houses, big cars, money can buy all kinds of things in the world, but again, again, I have to fall back on those saints from uh, Liverpool, the Beatles. Can't buy me love, everybody tells me so. Can't buy me love, no, 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 nada, nada, nada. That's it. The Beatles were telling us that you can't buy love because love is from God. Love is from God. And all of these things that the ego uses is to distract you from going inside and finding God, finding your, your Creator. So this is a good first part because we're seeing we go from Marilyn, the teenager who's watching movies all day long, to a, a, a wealthy man who basically says, oh come out here, I'll introduce you to all the people in Hollywood, or going to a particular uh, restaurant where there's famous people. And the lure of fame Fame seems like a good thing in this world, but anybody who's been famous can tell you it, it, it's like the love-hate relationship. It seems to offer something and then you think, oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? I always like, uh, I like to listen to what John Lennon had to say because John Lennon was just a bloke, a, a, a young lad from Liverpool. He started to play music, sing, he and his buddy uh, Paul formed a Beat the Beatles, and then the Beatles exploded like Marilyn Monroe's career. And then guess, guess who had paparazzi following him everywhere? Guess who could barely spend time with his wife in public because there was cameras always running, people writing things about him. He was not really a fan of fame after he got to see the flip side of it, how it just was, it was biting into his life. He felt like he, he had to try to avoid it, <laughs> to live his life, <laughs> you know, with his, with his wife and his son. So, the same thing with money. I mean, the, the thing about Marilyn Monroe is she's showing us that even if you achieve all of the goals that the ego would give to you, fame, beauty, sex appeal, and we'll see as it comes along, um, famous husbands, she becomes like an icon for the whole world, and yet these are all gifts of the ego. She will end her life in, in despair, in sadness, in, in feeling hurt, feeling betrayed, feeling rejected, and, and it's because that abandonment and that rejection and that hurt is the unconscious mind. If you don't allow the Holy Spirit and Jesus to really unveil that unconscious mind for you, then 
I will guarantee you that what will seem to come from hiding and holding on to the unconscious mind is reincarnation. <laughs> you, if you don't like your life right now, oh, believe me, it will just seem to repeat over and over and over and over until you say, I want to heal, which is a way to say, I want to know my creator. So in Marilyn's case, she's showing us all that the things that many of us have, have thought about or pursued in this world are fool's gold. They are not worth pursuing at all. Not in the least bit. If you could see the fire burning, why would you put your hand in the fire? <laughs> if you could see the fire. So Marilyn's going to show us today the fire. She's going to show us that if you hold on to a body identity and you try to improve that learning device, you are missing the lesson that the learning device was meant to teach. And the learning device of the body is only a communication device to be used by the Holy Spirit to teach you that there is no body and there is no world. Some of you just did uh, lesson 132 from the workbook. There is no world, period. That's, that's the lesson that forgiveness teaches, is you just, you've been hallucinating a world and you can stop it at any moment that you decide to stop hallucinating by, by not judging it. So here we go. She's, her star is rising in terms of the world, but, and she's all in for it. You know, she's taking every opportunity, every invitation, every opportunity, and the ego is building a, huge personality that is revered and adored by much of the world. It's, it's building its substitute for love, and in this case, it looks like Marilyn Monroe. And this is probably why Ken and Gary have said uh, that it's impressive. But again, it's just a pile of illusions piled onto each other and it's what Shakespeare had it right, much ado about nothing is what we're dealing with here. Even though it's puffed up to be this grand thing, it's really just what Shakespeare called much ado about nothing. Okay, now we're getting a little bit of an insight here. Uh, Jesus basically tells us in, in his text, he said, everyone who comes here to this world comes without a self and makes one up as they go along. Isn't that fascinating? Everyone who comes to this world comes without a self and then makes one as they go along. So as you pursue fame, as you pursue fortune, as you pursue being beautiful or sexual, as you pursue dating and relationships, this is the ego developing an image of you. That is not true. And you see how sneaky the ego is because the ego says if you have more money, more beauty, more popularity, more sex appeal, you see the ego is saying you're making a better self as you follow it. Everyone who comes here comes without a self and then makes one as they go along. They come without their Christ self when they come here. This is, this is what the Beatles, again, the saints, the Beatles, <laughs> he's a real nowhere man, living in his nowhere land, making all his nowhere plans for nobody. Yeah, you could say the same thing with Marilyn, you know. She comes, she's, she has no home life, she's in ten orphanages, or foster homes, She's bouncing around. She doesn't have a, a, a typical family. And she says, I'm, I was raised as a waif. And, and so she's this, this orphan girl, kind of will say, that, that basically doesn't have the stability of what some people go through as a stable family life. And then she watches movies and she looks at the movies and she thinks, wow, I could have the white hair and Look at the stars, the stars, Clark Gable, all the, the stars, those are the ones that seem to be what? The important bodies, right? 
Those are the important bodies. Those are the well-known bodies. Not the Jesus. Just learning devices. <laughs> nothing more. Nothing better, nothing worse. Just communication devices for reaching God. That's all they're for. But, you see how sneaky the self-concept is. The ego builds and builds a self-concept. Because everyone who comes to this world has a terrible, terrible dark sense of unworthiness. A sense of having forgotten God, forgotten their Christ identity. Everyone who comes to time and space has a very dark side, and I'm going to call that the unconscious mind, okay? <laughs> everyone who comes, comes with an unconscious mind. This is not in your religions throughout the centuries. The religions throughout the centuries are good behaviors, the bad behaviors, be good, go to heaven, be bad, burn in hell. Okay? <laughs> but once you start to get people like Freud or Carl, Carl Jung, for example, a psychotherapist comes along and he starts to talk about the shadow self and he basically says, you can't really reach your true self unless you look at the shadows. And Jesus says the same thing in his course. You, the, the more you look at, at the ego, the less you see of it. The more you expose the ego, the less you'll, you'll be aware of it or you'll perceive uh, its distortions. So you have to look at the darkness. And this is what this psychotherapist now in her life, as she comes into adulthood, here she is toward the end of her life, and the scenes we're seeing now is she's, she's making friends with the family. Her first family is this therapist and his uh, son and, two, and daughter and wife, and she's starting to become more friendly, more evened out a little bit. But now, by this point, she's, this is her last psychotherapist, she's an icon. She's, she's one of the most, if not the most famous lady in America or, or in, in much of the world. She's become like this huge icon where he can't, he has to go to her house to treat her because he knows it won't work. If she comes to their house, the press gets a hold of it and their life as, as a family is over. <laughs> If, if she is treated at, at their house. So he goes to her house, he works with her, and he, he basically says that the central pattern in her personality construct is she is acting out rejections from her childhood. So there we have it. The unconscious mind is the belief in rejection. And she's moved around to 10 foster homes, and she had no family life is what we would call family life and she just went from a teenager and she whoosh she went up into early 20s into stardom fame movies sex appeal and here she's being treated by a psychotherapist that is able to say in her mind she she is acting out rejection uh, from her childhood her childhood was acting out rejection and we'll see that her relationships will act out that same rejection and ultimately be part of, of her suicidal tendency is, is this sense of rejection. Being rejected by the ones that are supposed to love you. Mom and dad are supposed to love you, then how do you end up in 10 foster homes bouncing around? If your husband is supposed to love you and he turns his back on you, there's another reflection of rejection, you see? And even with Bobby Kennedy and JFK, they're still seen as friends. I think, obviously, from what we're hearing, she said uh, to the family, I have a new man in my life, and she's all excited. I can't tell you his name, so it's hidden, but he is called the General. Ha ha! Robert Kennedy is, is actually the Attorney General of the United States. The man in charge of the law enforcement of the entire United States is her new man. Wait a minute, but Bobby, Carey, Bobby Kennedy is married and he's got children. He's from the Kennedy family. How is this married man, who's the Attorney General of the United States, how is he the new man? 
you see? Well, if you've got a self-concept that you're the most attractive woman in the United States, you see the ego will play that card to try to get what it wants, which is just, it wants love and affection from bodies. You see, it doesn't see that the love is inside, it's in, inside you. It looks outside to generate a false sense of self, a false sense of completion, a false sense of acceptance in the dream characters, in the bodies. And this is why people have so much difficulty questioning their self-concept, their belief in their family. Because they don't realize that the ego made the construct up and that the only way that you reach back to the Christ is to question the construct. The whole construct of time and space, not just the, the family self-concept, not just the career concept. If we look at Marilyn, we could say, does Marilyn have a job? Oh yeah, she's got a lot of jobs, film jobs. She, she is a very famous movie actress. Does, does uh, Marilyn have a career? Yes, she does. She's got a, a career. It's a well-paying career. Is she successful in terms of the world's eyes? She, yes, she is. She has a very successful career. Is she beautiful as the world judges it? Oh, yes. Is she sexy as the world judges it? Oh, yes. It's almost like she has to maybe put a mole on her face, otherwise it looks... <laughs> she. <laughs> otherwise it's even too perfect. It's... It's, it has to have something, like a trademark or whatever. You see, it's, it's an image that's blown up out of proportion. And remember, God didn't create any of it. He didn't create this world of time and space. He didn't create bodies. He doesn't create personalities. They're all in projections of the ego belief in separation. So, here she is, toward the end of her, her life, and she's the family is now telling our investigator from Ireland that basically she opened up to them, she started to relax. Even the son, Danny, said, oh, she was my friend. We were both left thinking. They were both very liberal, liberal leftist thinking. Uh, you know, that's kind of interesting. You, you're you're le liberal leftist thinking, very, very liberal. On the far left, as the world calls it, and your new man is who? Bobby Kennedy, <laughs> the Attorney General. That's that's the establishment. That's the system. That's that's about as conservative as you get. Oh, we can start to see. Whoa, there's some conflicts in this ego personality. You're you have liberal leftist ideas, and you you're you're dating. We'll say. I mean, Bobby's married and has kids. I don't know, it was, what was his, Bobby Kennedy's wife, was it Ethel? Don't look Ethel! <laughs> don't, don't look Ethel. You, you start to realize that there's, in the personality self, there's going to be contradictions. There's going to be things, private thoughts. Oh my gosh, there's some private thoughts brewing in this story. Uh, if, if we've got a, a bombshell sex appeal woman who's an icon for the whole United States as a sex symbol. She's leftist thinking. Oh my gosh, an icon, sex symbol, leftist thinking. And she's got her eyes on the Attorney General of the United States. Oh my gosh. You talk about a drama brewing, there's a drama. But it's all ego. It's all based on a belief in separation from God. You see? The only way that you get happy and joyful is you have to unplug from that ego. Otherwise, you're going to have all these controversies, all these dramas, all these personality clashes that go on on the surface. And then you may even do all kinds of uh, therapy where you do past life therapy, past life regression, and you go into what you were. Okay, I was Cleopatra, then I was uh, uh, Julius Caesar, and then I was this and this. Well, you know, it's actually, that's not going to help you either, unless you go back to the beginning with Jesus and get to the bottom of the whole thing. 
that even your past life regressions are just going to show you the patterns, the effects of the ego belief system. They're not going to unplug you from it, but they will eventually show you, you need help. You need help to go with Jesus all the way to the bottom. Because you're not leaving time and space until you have no guilt. And you're not leaving guilt until you leave the ego. You, you need to divorce the ego. <laughs> well, let's all say it now. I divorce you ego. I, I am filing for divorce from the ego that I may know my Christ self, you see. But the only way you do that is you have to expose it. If you believe in it, then the world will reflect your belief. That's what's happening with Marilyn now. Orphan, she was a waif, orphan child, 10 foster homes, and then we see the ego says, don't worry Marilyn, I'll make you famous. I'll give you fame, popularity, money, sex appeal. I'll give you everything that I can give you as gifts. Gifts. It calls them gifts. These are things that are hiding us from our Christ identity and the ego, they're gifts. So some of you think, maybe I was drawn to be a nun or a priest. Hmm. Maybe you were in a past life. Maybe you took a stab at, at going into this state of mind beyond preferences, beyond desires of the world. Yeah, maybe so. Maybe you're not through. Maybe you'll be the bride of Christ or the husband of Christ yet. Maybe Jesus will get you. <laughs> Don't think Jesus has given up. You may leave Jesus at the altar in a few lifetimes, but he will come back for you because he knows who you are. And he's not going to let you play the game of, uh, of sleep or of oblivion forever. Jesus will never stop trying to reach you. And, and God will never stop coming for you because your true joy and happiness is in heaven. So here we go. We we'll continue on with uh, Marilyn Monroe here. As we can see, the ego is presenting her with lots of gifts. I mean, that, that's a lot of gifts. The ego is offering gifts. Uh -huh. Sneaky gifts. Okay, there you go. Jealous husband, you know. Sex appeal icon of a woman and then she marries a famous husband and Joe is a sweet guy. He's just retired from baseball. He's one of the all-time baseball greats. He's not he's not probably as famous. He's he's famous in New York City and some parts of the United States, but but Marilyn is like big time famous. She's like she's like an icon. Uh, she's a total icon. And then uh, she marries him. She maybe likes that he's concerned for her. Even the interviewer says, uh, "Oh, you." Joe says, "You can cook cook a, a mean steak." Well, I'm I'm learning. You know, she's a she's a sex appeal movie actress icon, and she's she's starting to learn how to cook a steak <laughs> because that's part of the sexual stereotype. Okay, wife. Doesn't matter if you've been in all the films and you make all this huge money and you're hugely famous and popular. Uh, she's learning how to cook, cook a steak, you know. How stereotypical is that? But what I'm showing you here is the whole self-concept is based on concepts. And basically Joe's husband concept didn't like 10,000 people watching his wife's skirt blow up repeatedly and take after take, you know, that triggered, that triggered his, his self-concept. Uh, and, and always when we're triggered, it's always the self-concept. We're not triggered by Christ. We're not triggered by the Holy Spirit. We're triggered by our belief in the ego. And the ego has generated these personality self-concepts, including all the roles, husband and wife all the stereotypes. Everything is all generated from the ego. So when we're offended, Joe seemed like he was offended with his wife filming a scene in New York City 
with her skirt blowing up repeatedly in front of ultimately five to 10,000 people watching the whole thing. And then he goes to the hotel and he's angry. He shouts and yells at her and he beats her up. Uh, because that's, again, the ego gets defensive because it holds on to a self-concept that it wants to be true. And if another person violates that, it will bring up its anger. But underneath that, it wants your mind to believe in these concepts, you see? That's why when we do these deep teachings, we're not talking Course in Miracles 101 here or introduction. A lot of even the, the first generation of Course teachers are way too afraid to see what the dismantling of the self-concept really is because of their own fear. And I'm talking, this is the depth that will take you into mysticism. We're not talking some kind of intellectual grasp of A Course in Miracles. We're talking actual self-realization, going to God, being willing to, to give your mind over to the guidance of the Holy Spirit and unwind from the entire concept of time and space and nothing less. This is mysticism. We're not bantering around concepts about A Course in Miracles, wondering what they mean. I'll tell you what they mean. They are just a bridge to realize that God is the Creator and God is the only cause. And there is nothing else that has a cause. Nothing of this world has a cause. This is a projected world of unreal effects that come from an unreal cause, which is the ego. And you can't just dilly-dally and tinker around with the effects and expect to wake up. You have to, you have to question the erroneous cause. Question the ego. Question what you believe in. Question your feelings. Question your thoughts. Don't, don't just give in to them as that, that's, oh, that's human nature, and oh, that's just the way things are. You've got to question the family self-concept, and you have to question your personality self-concept, and your country self-concept, like John Lennon did. Imagine there's no country. I wonder if you can. Nothing to kill or die for. A brotherhood of man. John was, uh, was starting to question the, the country self-concept. And, uh, and the ego didn't like that. The ego was spying on him. Had the President of the United States spying on John Lennon because he's singing a song like, Imagine There's No Country. <laughs> That's, that'll take the wind out of the sails of patriotism and nationalism when you start to realize that they're generated by the ego and they have no reality whatsoever. Krishnamurti was on to that. Krishnamurti for years would say, you have to question this crazy idea of nationalism. He knew that pride in countries was a construct. Krishnamurti was calling people out of the world like a good saint and mystic. So here we go. This is Marilyn's first famous husband, Joe DiMaggio. And Joe's just on the surface, he's a kind of a sweet guy. But when you get married, the the shadow will come up. <laughs> the shadow of control. My wife. Why are you looking up the skirt of my wife? You see the my part, the possessiveness is the ego. And that's what's triggering the anger. That's what's triggering the anger. It's, it's the ego's belief in possession that's being undone here in this first uh, marriage. So, uh, yeah, if you're Mar Marilyn Monroe, you know, if your husband yells at you and actually physically beats you and you are the sex appeal icon of the, of the United States, <laughs> I don't think she's concerned about money. <laughs> you know, she's, she's probably thinking like, hmm, this, this isn't the best idea, even though it's emotionally charged because the mind equates being married to a body as intimacy and being married to a body as love. And we all know that that is not divine love. That's, that's a shadow. That can sometimes be a good shadow for a while and, and help you with your mind training, but, but basically any interpersonal concept is still part of the ego. So even a marriage is just a, a stepping stone idea that helps you go deeper inside toward the light, deeper, higher towards the oneness. The true love is God. 
God's love is the only love. You start to realize there's not puppy love, not love of my, I like my New York Yankees or I like my baseball team, my football team. I love, I love the weather. I love where I live. I love the sky. I love the earth. I love Mother Earth. All right, please, please. God is eternal love, and God is not male or female. God is not masculine or feminine. It's just love is one, and duality covers over that experience of love. So that's why competition is not real, because there's not two to compete. That's why possession, possessiveness and jealousy in a, in a couple relationship is not real, because love does not possess. Love only gives. Love only gives. Love only knows itself. Love is not two. Love is one. But the, the symbols of interpersonal relationships can be used for a while, but it's, it's to reach un, agape, unconditional love. Don't get stuck in the symbols. Don't get stuck in the self-concepts. We will see Marilyn doesn't, doesn't last that long with Joe. <laughs> Joe's a good guy, but that's basically nine months. <laughs> and then she's she's ready for the next because the Holy Spirit has to keep you expanding and even in the case with Marilyn Monroe you know it's uh, maybe we could say that she's really uh, starting to undo this uh, belief in possessiveness that's where Joe comes in Joe's going to reflect her her belief in possessiveness and so Joe's doing a favor for all of us here by, by just reflecting that for a moment. So we go, hmm, would love possess? Uh, I don't think, I can't think of Jesus being possessive, you know. I, I just don't think he was possessive. <laughs> you know? In fact, he was the opposite. I am calling you out of the world. <laughs> oh, he, he wasn't interested in possessing. He was interested in forgiving and releasing. Okay, here we go. Show us more, Marilyn and Joe. So you can see that this friend of hers, Danny, who was the, her psych psychiatrist uh, son, he's showing us the private thoughts. Nothing ever turns out right. I don't have anything. I don't have anybody. Wow, is that a teaching device? Those are the thoughts going on inside Marilyn's mind. Wow. She has all the fame, all the money, all the, everything the world could offer. You can see what the thoughts are underneath and how sad they are. And this is a, probably one of the most striking examples of how Jesus says, you may have noticed a characteristic of the ego goals that you have pursued. When you have achieved them, they have not satisfied you. And so you are forced to look for other goals. The ego will throw other goals. With Marilyn, it went from movie after movie. She, her star rose. She's famous. She's popular. She, she basically has, has wealth. All the things the world would tell you to go after, she did. And I don't have anybody. I'm alone, you know, I, she's basically giving all of her depressing thoughts, even with all of the things that the ego offered her, all the gifts, you can see she's very sad. And this, why is this important is because what I would say is, doesn't this show you that you have no need to pursue the things of this world? Many of you maybe didn't start off thinking that you're a mystic or a saint or whatever, but I mean, when you start to really look open-eyed and honestly at that, then the, the question has to come into your mind, like, why am I putting all this effort and energy into education, into skill development, into trying to improve my body, into trying to improve my career, into trying to improve my business life, in trying to improve something of the world. Maybe you want to improve the world itself or some aspect of the world or the body or the personality. But this movie is showing us that if Marilyn went through all of this and she pushed all the right buttons in her mind and she got all the things to go her way, she could hardly believe it, how fast it happened. 
But if Marilyn has these thoughts and is depressed, then maybe all of us should take note and say, wow, maybe the ego is not the way to happiness. Because Marilyn has all the things that the ego would say you need for happiness, but she's not happy. I think it's a trick. I, I, I think it's, we've been pursuing the wrong direction. Even when people say, how, how is the world condition going to improve? How are, how are we going to come out of this tailspin of, of, of a, a war, of a pandemic, of, of climate change and, and, and all these things, global warming, pollution? Wait a minute, the world is, is a mirror and those are all just concepts. So actually Donald Trump did have it right when he said there is no global warning, warning, warming. <laughs> Because that was the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Not in his mind, I, I think he, he might have been a pretty big case of denial, but if you actually just look at it from the ideas, <laughs> that's Jesus in there. <laughs> there is no global warming. Because why? Because the world's a projection. You can't have a warm illusion. The illusion can't get too warm. Because why? Illusion means nothing. Oh, we got a problem. We got a warm illusion going on here. <laughs> you see? Now you can start to sleep at night and not worry about global warming. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm taking your mind off the hook. <laughs> you can even laugh at that one, even though that most people would say, oh, that's, no, David, you're taking it too far. That's, that's, that's not politically correct. I'm not interested in politically correct. I'm interested in the Holy Spirit's correction. <laughs> You see? Which is that nothing I see means anything and that, that I need to remember my purpose to forgive the world, not to get caught up into trying to make the world a better place. So, so we've just seen her go through, she burned through this uh, first marriage back from 1954 with Joe DiMaggio pretty quickly. Um, but I, th I think that it's not a matter of burning through a marriage, it's just like, it's just like, what we see reflected, is it something that, that we can agree with? And for most of us, I would say the idea of possession seems to be something that's pretty strong in this world, but it's not, it's in our mind. Why not be like a saint and, and even be like Jesus? You know, I, I've often heard that, that Jesus didn't carry money. <laughs> Isn't that nice? That's a nice kind of idea. Jesus didn't carry money. So one, he had the apostles one time and they're getting ready to go into the temple in Jerusalem. They have to pay the temple tax. And so basically, I think in the Urantia book it says that, that they were able to get a coin from the mouth of a fish to pay the temple tax to get in. How's that for a career? Get your coins out of the mouth of a fish. <laughs> Sounds like Jesus can arrange time and space if you do his work, you know. So that's what I'm saying is you have to realize that the world is just symbols. But Jesus still had the apostles pay the, the temple tax. He didn't try to overthrow the temple and say, sorry, we have no money, but we're going in anyway. He had them pay the tax, you see? He's not here to overthrow the ego's laws. He's, he's here to show that divine law is higher than anything the ego can come up with. So that's what we're learning uh, in our spiritual awakening. Now you saw with the first marriage, it ended with possessiveness. But now she's getting married to a man who, who sees, recognizes her intelligence, who seems to be very intelligent. He's also very famous very successful, but on the inside of the ring, it says, now is forever. Here comes Jesus. <laughs> Here comes Jesus, you see. Now is forever. That's like right out of the course, <laughs> on the inside of her wedding ring, you see. So this is where the progression, it's all just symbols. People are like, oh, 
a lost marriage. You can see she was very sad when her first marriage broke up. She was very shaken and everything. But the spirit is using the learning devices to reach eternity. Now is forever, is on the inside of the ring. You see, it's everything is just symbols taking us higher and higher towards eternity. Isn't that beautiful? So there is no such thing as a failed marriage. <laughs> what you think you did wrong, you didn't really do wrong. And what you think you did right, you didn't do right either. <laughs> you see how deep it goes. It, it takes you away from the guilt of believing that you know what's happening. Because the world is a projection of the ego. And so there's nothing good or bad happening in the world. This little learning device is, is helping us. Now we've got a lot of learning devices in the Zoom room today. We're using them appropriately. I see Patty's even getting a little exercise for her, her uh, learning device. They're very good. You're, you're multitasking. You're learning about spiritual enlightenment and on the treadmill. So this is it. The learning device is just a learning device to help our mind find its innocence, to forgive the world. And even with Arthur Miller, you see the first marriage, she married Joe DiMaggio, famous athlete, very famous athlete who just retired. And then, okay, did the athlete thing. And then we'll shift over. Okay, Joe, Joe, all right. Now, Arthur's in there now. And now she's starting to question, what is the value of intelligence? Isn't, isn't that a nice marriage to question the value of intelligence? <laughs> Marry a playwright. You see how it works? Jesus is in the mind having some fun, going, oh good, good. Now let's let's go through the intelligence thing. Because who is central intelligence? No, it's not the CIA of the United States. It's JC Central. That's right. The central intelligence is JC Central. Get that clear. Because Divine intelligence is the only intelligence that can really use these learning devices well. <laughs> the ego will use them for pride, for pleasure, for attack. The ego will try to use them for all kinds of twisted ways, dramas, conflicts, sex, all kinds of things. But the thing about it is, these are learning devices for the mind, the mind to wake up. This is for central intelligence. JC Central. But you have to put JC Central in charge of everything. Because that central intelligence, if you just use it a little bit here and there, you know, you'll only get a little miracles here and there. But you need lots of miracles to wake up. So that's why we're, we're seeing it now. So I just want to emphasize that that all things are working together for good. This Now this marriage here with Arthur Miller is is opening some new things. Look at it now. Instead of cooking steaks, trying to learn how to cook steaks for Joe, the athlete, she's opened her own production company in New York City. You see, she's starting to expand. She's starting she's going through now the unlearn the business phase. <laughs> she started her own business and eventually, you know, we have to let that go too, but it just it's all about building our confidence in following the miracle. All about building our confidence and expanding our awareness. That's really what, what it's all about. That's it. That's enough for Arthur. <laughs> but you can see the main thing in the Course, Jesus says, is how does God's teacher react to magic thoughts? And those our magic thoughts. I'm disappointed in her. You know, I'm not, she's not what I thought. I thought she was an angel. She's not what I thought I was, what, what I thought she was. And then she's a whore. Oh my gosh. There come the private thoughts. And this is what happens in relationships. Has anybody noticed that in your relationships where you get in and then suddenly the private thoughts start flying around? <laughs> And then you're like, holy Christ, uh, what do I do with all these magic thoughts, these private thoughts? And, and Jesus says in the Course, how the question to Jesus is, how do God's teachers deal with magic thoughts? And he says, 
their first responsibility is not to attack them. <laughs> you see how, how Jesus is like, watch, watch them come, watch them come into awareness, but don't attack them. Forgive them. Give these magic thoughts over to the Holy Spirit, because they're not coming from other people. There's only one mind. You can't, we can't now blame Arthur Miller <laughs> and say, what a raunchy husband, you know, my God, Th thinking his wife's a whore and, and thinking, you know, she's not what he thought, you know. No, we can't blame Arthur. It's not Arthur's problem. It's the unconscious private thoughts coming up in awareness to be forgiven for the mind, the mind. We don't have, we don't have 6.8 billion separate minds that we're dealing with here. I've had people say to me, I'm doing really good with my ego, but it's just the ego of other people that I can't stand. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a problem with that is that, that the ego makes, make, makes us a, a self and then it makes an ego for every other self. So all of the world is, is projection of ego thoughts. So you can see to forgive it, you really have to go deep into your mind because this is the ego's world. It's not that you become a saint and the rest are sinners. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> Some people have said, I think I want to do what the the Indian saints, I think I would like to live in a tree or in a cave so I can get away from all the other egos <laughs> in the world. No, no, believe me, this is the fast track. Jesus is giving us the fast track. He's, he's showing us the innocent, even with the images right in our face, right in your face, he's, he's going to show how innocent you are and how innocent they are. And that's where the trans transformation happens, when you start to realize it's not, it's not in the people, it's in the thoughts and the beliefs in the mind. That's what needs the overhaul. I did a, a booklet years ago called Mind Overhaul. You know, you think of a, like a car, automobile, engine overhaul. This is my, my booklet was called Mind Overhaul. <laughs> and that's what Jesus wants us to do. Okay, here we go. Marilyn's moving. She's moved through two husbands now pretty quickly here and we're we're taking close look at her mind. Like what is it what is the lesson here? So if we look at those last couple of movies there, Some Like It Hot, she's pregnant with Arthur Miller and she's shooting the film Some Like It Hot with all of the scenes on the beach and this and that. There's miscarriages that come and, and the emotional toll of wanting something. She wants a baby and miscarriage comes. That's, that's a trigger of, of loss. Uh, that's the belief in loss acted out in terms of form. That's what it is. It's not that the miscarriage caused her to be sad, it's the belief in loss, which is the ego, that brings about the sadness. And then the world just is a scenario or a dream that plays out that. It's not a tragedy in the sense that it's chosen, but the mind that chooses the ego is choosing loss. And then it's, it's seeing pictures, uh, dreams, it's dreaming of scenarios and like miscarriages, that's the loss. And then <clears throat> even the title of the film, Some Like It Hot, it's starting to get intense in her life because um, she's been through one marriage, she's married to Arthur Miller, but there's, there's difficulties in the relationship. She has a pregnancy, she has miscarriages, and, and you can start to see that's the, the heat of the mind, the intensity of this unconscious guilt coming up for healing release. Then we heard John Huston talking, who's the, the filmmaker of Misfits, and you can see that at this point, She's still in this relationship with Arthur Miller, but um, the title of the movie is The Misfits, you see? And I would say it's not so much that Marilyn and Arthur are misfits, but 
But the mind that has fallen asleep and believes in this world is misfit. The separation is a, is a misfit. It's a gigantic misfit in awareness. If you're the Christ and you're believing that you're some little person in a, in a world that's outside of you, that's a misfit of identity. That's a misfit of identity in an enormous capacity of being the, a creation of God and thinking you're something that's nothing like a creation of God. Nothing like spirit. You see, that's the, talk about misfits, that's like the ultimate misfits. You might say that the human condition could be the movie The Misfits. Because all the characters are generated by the ego and they have nothing to do with spirit. And spirit is, is love. Spirit is reality. So this is a world of misfits in that sense. But it's all part of a progression as we learn to, that our one need is forgiveness. You may believe you have many needs and it may seem very complex in your life if you think, oh, I've, I've got physical needs, I've got financial needs, I've got nutritious needs, I've got exercise needs, I need psychological uh, stimulation, I need physical stimulation, you know, it, the ego paints a pretty, pretty complicated picture and then comes the Holy Spirit and Jesus. No, your one need is forgiveness. And if, if you actually believe that, wouldn't you put every ounce of effort and energy into that experiencing that, that need as, as fulfilled? Wouldn't you put your whole life's devotion into forgiveness? If you understood that that's your only need and that is the escape hatch from time and space. It's like if you were in a submarine and there was a leak and the submarine was taking on water and you needed to swim to find the hatch at the top of the submarine so you could open it and swim up to the air. That's about how it is. Whenever you think, oh, I kind of, you know, I'm working on my spiritual spirituality, but you know, I got some career options going here, and I got some family things going here, and you know, and they just opened a new Mexican restaurant down the street. I got to go try these tacos. I really want to see what those tacos are. Nada, nada, nada. One need. Forgiveness. One need. Atonement. That's it. And then when you start to focus your mind's energy on that one need, you start to get happy. Of course! <laughs> why, why wouldn't you get happy if you put your mind energy in forgiveness? Because it's the one need. <laughs> you know? I, I still, yeah, I think of the Beatles again. All you need is love. Ba -ba -da -da -da. All you need is love. Ba -ba -da -da -da. All you need is love, love, love is all you need. <laughs> Come on, the Beatles, the Beatles are telling us if, if we can't get it with the Beatles, how are we going to get this? <laughs> you know, it's, it's coming to us from every angle now. It's saying, wake up, wake up. So here we go. You can see now it's starting to, to get a little closer towards the end of her life and the suicide, but but if you really start to, to look at it, you can see the foster homes, rejection. Uh, you can see it with Joe DiMaggio, rejection. And then you can see the belief acted out starting here with a little bit more years with uh, Arthur Miller. But actually, when he says things like, you know, I thought she was an angel, but she's not like that. Uh, she's a whore, you know, that, those kind of things is just the unconscious coming up. And that's the time to forgive. That's not the time to dismiss your partner. <laughs> it's the time to forgive the thoughts that you have about your partner. You see, that's the difference here. Forgive the thoughts that you are holding on to in awareness that you're judging your partner or the world. You know, release that. So, ah, the plot thickens now. Good old friends, Bobby and John F. Kennedy from the East Coast, Maryland, with their interesting relationships going on with both of them. 
then John F. Kennedy goes from being a, an East Coast senator that nobody knows about in, the, in California to being the president of the United States and his brother Bobby is the attorney general of the United States of America, the top uh, law enforcement officer. You've heard of police officers. All the one that's on top of all the police officers in the United States is the attorney general, <laughs> for those of you for your politics. So we have the one that's in charge of the, of the law in the United States, and we have the president of the United States involved in, we'll say, affairs. And it's not just affairs, because Bobby and uh, John F. Kennedy are, uh, are married, although, uh, you know, Robert's we wedding and marriage goes back some years, and, and same with Jackie. But, but now we're going to start to see, once you enter the realm of politics, that there is going to be people that have opposing views to the president and to the attorney general. Um, there's Hoffa, the, the mob, the mafia is going to be against Bobby and, and Jack. There's going to be people hiring private detectives and we have just seen this man who's, who's this well-paid private detective and, and he's asked the question on, the, on an interview, like, how do you justify invading people's privacies? And he says, well, if you can see it and you can hear it, it's not private. So he doesn't mind using wiretaps in people's houses or anything, because that's his philosophy. Well, if you can see it and you can hear it, it's not private. Jesus would go even further. Jesus would say, if you, if you can perceive it, and you can hear it, and you're even thinking about it, it's private, and it's ego. And that's why every thought that you have that doesn't come from God is a private thought. And now you see, I've had Course in Miracles teachers that have said, David, does Jesus even talk about private thoughts in the Course? And I said, yeah, he, he does in the workbook where he says you have no private thoughts except, and yet that's all that you're aware of. Wow. And then he also says basically, and I believe it's chapter 15 when he's talking about the Holy Instant, he says, you know, if, if you would know the Holy Instant and you would have a connection with everyone and everything without exception, you must have no private thoughts, no secrets. Oh my gosh, this is central to his teaching of forgiveness. It's about relinquishing private thoughts and letting the thoughts of God fill your mind. Of course that would be the way back to God. If judgmental thoughts are of the ego and you, you offer those to the Holy Spirit and you say, clear my mind and let the thoughts I think with God, let my real thoughts come and fill my mind, you're going to get happy. So happy that you'll forget the world <laughs> and wake up to heaven. That's happy. That's like divine happiness, true divine happiness. So you can see with Marilyn now, she's gone through two marriages and the day that she gets divorced from Arthur Miller is the day that John F. Kennedy takes his oath of office as the President of the United States. So she now has friendships with the President of the United States and then the Attorney General, which Bobby will become. And, and her own thinking is, by the standards of politics, it's more radical. It would be like to the far left. So, so basically when she goes to meet with the Kennedys, she's writing down some notes about a conversation she wants to get into because she started, I think she's kind of interested in um, equality, which they were kind of interested in too, but she was so interested in equality, she was questioning a communism, for example, and that is not the kind of thing that is valued in American politics. <laughs> that's, the, that's the opposite end of where the political establishment is. When you start to examine 
like socialism, communism, different kind of ideas. Marilyn's just exploring, expanding her mind, but now two of her dear friends happen to end up in the top of the establishment of the United States political power structure. So you can see that she has a friendship with them, she has an exploration with them, probably there was definitely some sexual things going on there as well, and now she has to, uh, she's starting to weigh on these things in her mind. Um, because I think for most people we could say friendship is important. You know, most people do value friendship. And, and yet, when you start to get into the realm of friendship, the ego will try to pull its, its ace card again, and in her case, it is rejection. You see? There's, there's nothing so hurtful as being rejected by a close friend. And yet, the rejection's not occurring in the form between the people. Remember who invented the rejection. It's the ego again. God did not create rejection. God did not create abandonment. God did not create guilt. God is, is not a creator of secrecy and private thoughts. You see? The whole construct is built on private thoughts and God has no secrets. God is just pure love. So this is why the forgiveness requires the relinquishment of the private thoughts. You have to get really good at giving your private thoughts over to the Holy Spirit. Because once you don't hide them and protect them, once you just say, oh, that's a crazy thought, I give it over to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will take it away immediately. But, when you hide it and protect it, you push it into the unconscious, and then you see it acted out in the world. And then it seems heartbreaking. But just remember, the mind is in charge of this. Nobody in the form is rejecting anybody. It's always, you look inside first, and what you hold on to and believe in, including with the ego, is where the darkness comes. It's not in the world. It's, the world is just a projection. It's like a, a projection in a theater, you know. It's not, it's just a projection of images, but the way that you interpret those images depends on the thought system and the belief system that you hold on to in the mind. Okay, you know private thoughts is one thing when you're dealing with them as a Course in Miracles student, but Politics and private thoughts, it's a dangerous, <laughs> it's a dangerous combination, a dangerous cocktail. You know, they're looking at, back in this time, the threat of nuclear war with the Soviet Union. Gee, isn't that interesting? Here we are in 2022, and what are we looking at again? Oh, a threat of nuclear war with the communists, with Russia. You see? 62, 72, 82, 92, 2002, 2012, 2022. Wow, that's a lot of decades and we're still in the same situation. <laughs> the ego is, wow, the ego can really play its cards. But, as I would remind you, these are concepts in the mind. Communism is a concept in the mind. Socialism is a concept in the mind. Democracy is a concept in the mind. What do these three things have in common? Communism, socialism, and democracy. They're all inventions of the ego. <laughs> That's what they have in common. This will get you out of politics for a while. Marianne Williamson, are you listening to me? This will take you out of politics big time when you start to realize that the sides that you see, maybe back then it was the United States and Russia and Cuba, now we might say it's, uh, it's Ukraine and EU and the United States and Russia. You see, the characters have changed, sometimes the, the countries change, but the common denominator is the ego is behind it. All conflict, all side-taking, all concepts are of the ego. 
In fact, I did read that to you early on when I was talking uh, early on. Uh, this, I'll come back to the quote I read from Jesus from chapter 2. Jesus says, Most of the loftier concepts of which you are capable are now are time dependent. And he means not only the loftier concepts, but also the lower, seemingly lower base concepts. They're all private thoughts. You see, this is why forgiveness is necessary, because otherwise you're going to find yourself getting defensive for Ukraine. <laughs> you know, you'll, you'll find yourself getting angry at Putin and the Russians. But the only problem is Putin and the Russians aren't the problem. Communism, socialism, capitalism, democracy, you know, democracy admittedly is a symbol of one vote for one person. It's, a, it's got a little bit of sprinkles of e equality starting to come in, so that's why people resonate with it. Uh, a lot of Americans, for example, resonate with that. Many Ukrainians res resonate with it, but, but ultimately what I'm saying is, this is why you have to go to the bottom of the unconscious mind, because, because the ego is generating all these concepts and projecting them onto the world. So, so then, here we have two learning devices again. All they are is for communication. You're saying, is that Marilyn again? No, this is Putin and this is Biden. <laughs> now I... I'm, I'm giving different names to the learning devices, Putin and Biden, and you may have opinions there, but it's the same thing as Joe DiMaggio in Maryland or Arthur Miller in Maryland. Learning devices are learning devices. The learning devices don't make mistakes. That's good, Al. I need help. You've got a purple, a purple device there. So you see what it is, is you, this is what the lessons of A Course in Miracles are about. The first lesson of A Course in Miracles is nothing I see means anything. Because he has to start to show us that our ego mind has projected meaning onto the world and it's not real, it's not true. That's lesson number two. I have given everything I see all the meaning it has for me. You know. And, and it goes on from there. But basically, Jesus has to teach us that what we are believing and what we're thinking and what we're perceiving isn't real. That's a big job. <laughs> That's a big job. If, if you're convinced that the, the, the floor beneath your feet is solid, then Jesus is like, oh, we've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> because it's just an image. The, the feet are an image and so is the, the floor. But it's a projection of belief. And then when your whole identity is caught up in that projection of belief, then, then it seems real. I was talking with Frances a few days ago and, and we were talking, and Frances was talking about some of her experiences with Lesson 133. In, in A Course in Miracles, I will not value what is valueless. And basically, what Jesus is, is teaching us is he's saying, from within the dream world, you don't see that it's all concepts and beliefs, so you believe it's real. You believe all of it's real. And it's, the evidence seems pretty strong if your five senses are reflecting back to you those beliefs. It's a pretty tight system. You know, you can see how how difficult it seems to be to question your beliefs when your five senses, which are part of your beliefs, are showing you a, a fragmented world. And now you're being asked to forgive, to come back to reality. So when Jesus says, I'm calling you out of the world, he's basically saying, I'm calling you from the realm of illusions into the realm of heaven, which is the realm of eternal reality. But, when you go through it, it's, it's not a well-documented um, case. I mean, throughout all of history, we have some mystics and saints and avatars and great teachers, but they're sprinkled throughout history. And what they're advocating is that you stop judging. And, and yet, if your identity is, is dependent upon judging, you see that's going to take a lot of trust, 
a lot of faith to let that go. You know, it's like you're in the swimming pool and Jesus is like, get out of the water. <laughs> and you're like, but I like the water. <laughs> He's like, you don't know the light. <laughs> You'll like the light. Get out of the water. <laughs> you know? And and then it's like, but I just got a new bikini, a new bathing suit, and I I'm just learned how to swim. And I like the feel of the water on my skin, and I like to splash around, and I just bought a new inner tube to play with. Get out of the water. <laughs> you know, it's like, Jesus, get out of the, of the water. There was one time where Helen Shuckman, she was the scribe of A Course in Miracles, and and Jesus was talking to her in, in her mind, and Jesus said to her, what do you do when you find yourself in the middle of a desert? And Helen was like, what? What is this? Some kind of, is this some kind of a riddle? Now we have, is Jesus Christ telling me riddles now? Is that what's happening here? She's the scribe. And then Jesus repeated to her, what do you do when you find yourself in a desert? And Basically, uh, yeah, Helen was like, I don't know, I give up, you know, like, is this a joke? I give up. What What do I do when I find myself in a desert? He said, leave. Leave. <laughs> you got it. That's a metaphysical joke. You know, I, I like it. I think it's funny. <laughs> but that's what Jesus meant by I'm calling you out of the world. You know, he's basically saying, you're not really home. This isn't our home. Even the apostles 2,000 years ago, they were, they thought he, he was going to come and teach them how to rule the earth. But the earth isn't what needs ruling. It's, it's the mind that needs to forgive to wake up to eternity, to heaven. Okay, it's the thought, the plot thickens. Now we have the Kennedy brothers and uh, wow, this is turning into a very, these tapes are very interesting. Uh, we might say the... Uh, Marilyn Monroe, the unheard private thought tapes. <laughs> this we're giving it our own Course in Miracles title. I don't think Netflix will like that, but but we're calling it for our purposes uh, the mystery of Marilyn Monroe, the unheard private thought tapes, and we're going on to hear a little bit more now. You've, now we're going from a, a relationship with the president and Bobby Kennedy to her leftist ideas, which we can only say, may, she maybe was saying in, in their meetings, I don't think pursuing atomic weapons is the most humane thing to be doing. You see, there's the, there's the part. And here, of all people that's in the discussion with the Kennedys, is Marilyn Monroe, <laughs> who has her, her friends in Mexico that were kicked out of uh, America and that she's with. So you can see this is part of the ego's distraction game. The ego makes up the, the bodies, it makes up the countries, it makes up the conflicts, communism, democracy, capitalism, socialism, you see, and then the characters, it, it takes sides. This side versus that side. And then the tensions grow, but but it's not an issue between countries. It's not an issue between those who favor atomic weapons and those who don't favor atomic weapons. It's not the right conservative against the leftist liberal. These are all make-believe distractions to keep your mind from getting quiet. All of politics, all of the ruckus, that's on the news all the time, right now, even in uh, Ukraine and everything. I will guarantee you that if you go deep enough, you will see that the conflict has been made up by the ego to keep you from knowing who you are. That is the point of all conflict. That is the point of all competition. That is the point of all side taking, is to one reason is to keep you from knowing who you are. So, 
this is why if you get into non-duality deep enough, and if you get into spirituality deep enough, you will realize that that the only connection that po politics has to your peace of mind is that you be a passerby. You need to release those concepts and beliefs that are political because, because the ego generated them to keep you from being still. This is about transcending artificial problems because the artificial problems were made by the ego as a distraction. Now, of course, the Holy Spirit meets the mind where it's at. So, for a mind that believes in, in politics, we'll say, for example, then the Holy Spirit has to reach that mind and try to inspire it into the most helpful thoughts and therefore actions that will bl bring the greatest blessing to everyone. But what I'm saying is, if you want to bring the ultimate blessing to everyone, you have to forgive the world. You have to forgive the politicians. Why? Because they're bodies. Who created the bodies? The ego. Why did the ego create the bodies? It projected guilt and conflict out onto a world to keep you so busy and so distracted that you wouldn't meditate or pray. <laughs> you see, it's a pretty sneaky game. <laughs> so busy with externals, we'll call them, that you never go inside to find who you really are. So this is, we're pulling the rug on everything. Uh, I've, I've done talks like this, I mean people may say, well you really are, are going after some politicians today. Well, I think when I was down in Kangaroo Valley, I showed Michael, Moore, Michael Moore's movie Capitalism, A Love Story, and I went after capitalism for four hours. <laughs> The tent was shaking. The tent almost blew down. The ego was having a fit because it's like, let's unveil this. Let's get what's underneath capitalism. Competition. Oh, where did competition come from? Did God create, a God of oneness create competition? Uh, whoops. No. So underneath these isms, uh, we start to realize there's a lot of false belief and that's what needs to be exposed and released. It's the false concepts and beliefs that are the problem. It's, it's not what's happening in the world. And um, I mean, I've, I've actually, I think I was in uh, Denmark one time where Francis and I and Jason Kirsten, we, we basically, we were doing a gathering in a factory, in a loft, but we didn't realize we were in the industrial part of Aarhus. And right across the street from us, while we're doing this uh, series of gatherings, is a slaughterhouse. It's a slaughterhouse where uh, animals are being slaughtered. So uh, I, I had people that were vegetarian that were writing to me complaining about my teachings. <laughs> because I was just going again to dismantle the belief in what seems to be organic life in this world. You know, it's not a matter of, of trying to think that there's life in form because life is God and life is in the mind, is in, our, in, in spirit. And that's what life is, so that kind of life cannot be threatened. But if you believe that life is in form, uh, then you end up with lots of difficulties, a lot of emotional difficulties because that brings in a whole wave of abuse, of neglect, you know, all the ego's other ideas are welcomed in with that too. So as I've said before, uh, Ken Wapnick was one time asked, <clears throat> what does the Course say about life on other planets? And Ken's response was, the Course says there is no life on this planet. Yeah, let's, let's smoke that in our pipe while we watch the end of Maryland. <laughs> There it is. Now it's getting down to what's going on psychologically. What if you had two close friends that you adored and you, you just sang Happy Birthday Mr. President to one of them with all the glee and joy and happiness in your heart extending out during this beautiful birthday song 
pouring out all this love. And then, due to political things, atomic nuclear divisions of opinion and everything, um, and also, we'll say, lots of sexual encounters over the years, if you put all that together and then you get a message from Bobby that basically says, you're not to contact us anymore. It's over. You're, you're cut off. You know, some of you know how that feels when you, whether you had a parent or a child who cuts you off, says no more contact. No more contact whatsoever. You know, you can just see that the emotional hurt that's generated by the ego is absolutely devastating. And that emotional hurt is just reenacting the hurt of separation from God. Remember, it's not that there are actually people that cut off other people. It's just that the projection of, of the behaviors and the actions are an interpretation of the hurt of this fall from grace. The interpretation of the hurt of the belief that you can leave your Creator. Something that is unfathomable. If God is pure love and you believe that somehow you were able to, to separate yourself from that love, that is, that is the hurt in the mind. That is the ontological hurt in the mind. And then the dream world just acts that out. So in this case with Marilyn, you know, here she is. She has two of her dearest friends that she's enjoyed discussions and playfulness at the beach house and who knows what all in the Malibu beach house. And then suddenly your playmates are, one of them's calling and saying, don't ever contact us again. You are completely cut off. It's like in the Jewish tradition when they tear the, the sleeve, or tear the, the collar, is a sign of being disowned. You know, anybody who's been in the Jewish tradition, when you've been disowned by your parents or disowned by, by your community or your rabbi, it's the same thing. It's a sense of deep alienation, deep isolation, deep breaking off of communication where before you were just chatting as friends. She's calling the Attorney General's office, talking to the Secretary. Can you have Bobby call me? She's friends with Jack. And then suddenly, because of ego conditions, there's a complete severing of communication. So this is really showing us that, that you know, when you take it and you think of just one of your close friends or your best friends, just basically cutting off communication entirely. And uh, that's a sense of being disowned. That's like disowning the, the friendship. That's like trying to dis... It's interpreted as disowning the connection. And that is extremely traumatic. But it's an ego interpretation, you see? The Holy Spirit is not buying it. The Holy Spirit knows that this is just a, a swirl, swirling group of simultaneous images. That's our next uh, retreat, the Holy entering the Holy Instant, because you have to start to realize that time isn't what you thought it was. Time really isn't linear at all. It's it's actually simultaneous, and all the grievances come from from believing in the ego's invention of of linear time, when time is actually simultaneous. That's what the that's where the healing occurs. Now we're starting to get into the psycholo psychological aspects of this of feeling hurt, of feeling betrayed, of feeling misused, like a piece of meat, uh, of, of breaking of confidence, of trust, of faith. You can see this is where the separation starts to come closer and closer because uh, we can see from this movie that that our our Irish friend with the white hair and his his dogged determinism to get down to what happened, what actually happened in form, how did Marilyn go on her final day? Let's get the truth. Let's get the truth of what actually happened. But I'm here to tell you now, 
Jesus is with me and he's saying, actually what happened isn't the most important thing because the world was over long ago and you, your interpretation of what happened is what's hurting you. You see, if you're feeling sad, it's your interpretation of the events that's hurting you. They're all happening simultaneously. There is no story even. You, you're fabricating a, a storyline that's not there. God didn't create linear time. God only knows eternity. And the Holy Spirit just knows it's all simultaneous. But as soon as you start interpreting anything in linear terms, you are in the ego. And you will feel its feelings. You will feel the grief, the hurt, the abandonment. You know, the ego can't stand to look on God. I mean, it, it would disappear in the presence of love. So the ego can't even be in the presence of holiness. And that's why Jesus could cast out demons, raise the sick, walk on water. He could do anything because he was not in time and space. You see, he's not a person. He's, he's the divine mind with the Holy Spirit that's just observing it. And, and therefore, from that state of mind, the dead were raised, the deaf could hear, the blind could see, you know, demons were cast out. Everything that occurred is just a reflection of a, of a unified mind. And that's the key. Now, I know a lot of you are curious about, well, what's, what's our detective friend going to show you? Uh, I think with Jesus, I would like to stop a moment because you're all into spiritual awakening. So let's just do a little bit of investigating into the mind now. Will you join me in dropping down deeper into the mind to see what's really going on? Because it's not the events that happened back in, in the early 1960s that are important. It's not how she actually died or what time of day she died. That's not important. But the dynamics going on in your mind are important because your purpose has to be to free yourself from the ego like Jesus did. That is your single purpose. So, I did a little bit of investigating myself into A Course in Miracles <laughs> during the movie and I decided to go, oh, what do we got here, Jesus? What do you got to tell us? I started fishing around into the depths and I started to go into those chapters 15 to 24. Oh, about the special relationship. Oh, about the guilt. What's underneath? Let's go scuba diving with Jesus now as we're watching the end of this Marilyn Monroe. Why don't we go scuba diving into our mind with Jesus to see what he has to say? What I came upon was in chapter 19 of A Course in Miracles, I noticed that this was the area of the Course that deals with the obstacles to peace. Anybody familiar with the obstacles to peace? Course in Miracles? There's four obstacles. So I went into that section and I noticed that there were three interesting ideas that Jesus talked about in that section in chapter 19. And the first one is called the attraction of guilt. Where are you going to find a book on this planet <laughs> that talks about the attraction of guilt? You see, when you go much deeper, you see it's not about the characters in this world. It's about what's going on in the mind. So come with me on a a journey now into the subconscious of the mind with Jesus Christ to help clarify what's going on. So the first one is attraction of guilt. And this is what Jesus has to say about the attraction of guilt. Because admittedly on the surface, nobody wants to feel guilty, right? I don't know. I, I don't have many friends that, that tell me, oh, I, I love being guilty. I can't wait to be guilty all weekend. You know, most of my friends are, are telling me, what the hell? How do I get out of this guilt? <laughs> this guilt and unworthiness that I feel. So here we go. Jesus has taken us on a ride. The attraction of guilt. The attraction of guilt produces 
fear of love, for love would never look on guilt at all. It is the nature of love to look upon only the truth, for there it sees itself, with which it would unite in holy union and completion. So basically, love is only looking to look upon the truth and unite with it, and there in holy union and completion. That sounds like something I want to know more about. What? Love and truth united? Sounds deep. Sounds deep. But he's saying the attraction of guilt produces fear of love. That must mean if I identify with the ego, and I feel the ego's emotions, guilt, then I'm going to be afraid of that which is greater than the ego. Because I'm identifying with something that's an illusion, I'll be afraid of the reality. Wow, that's deep. You mean to tell me I'm afraid of love because of guilt? Jesus is like, yes. Unconscious guilt is generating a fear of love. You're not afraid of dying. You're not even afraid of getting sick. You're terrified of love and you're not conscious of it. You, you think you're afraid of all these characters in the dream and all these forces, but they're all just projections. You're afraid of who you are. You're afraid of the I am presence. As love must look past fear, so must fear see love not. For love contains the end of guilt as surely as fear depends on it. Love is attracted only to love. Doesn't that resonate? Love is attracted only to love. Overlooking guilt completely, it sees no fear. So what Jesus is doing is in this section on chapter 19, Obstacles for Peace, he's starting off with the attraction to guilt. He's saying, the ego has you attracted to guilt to maintain itself, to keep itself covered and hidden. And it won't be gone as long as it's covered and hidden. So what could we say about idols? The attractions in sexuality, the attractions to money, fame, power, personal power, wealth, all the things of this world are part of the attraction to guilt. And that's why when people say, I love God, why can't I wake up? It's because everything that you're attracted to in this world is the attraction of guilt. And I mean everything in form without exception. If you're attracted to anything in this world, a beautiful sunset, you're attracted to guilt. If you're attracted to a, a rose or a daisy, if you're attracted to a kitty cat, if you're attracted to any form, Venus or some of the angels, Michelangelo uh, art or the Sistine Chapel or beautiful cathedrals or beautiful things, Jesus is like, no, no. My altar is not in a cathedral. My altar is in your heart. God is in your heart. You can reach God just by desiring God. You don't even need cathedrals. You don't need the things of this world to find God. God is right there closer than your breath if you're willing to just desire God. Hallelujah! Praise God! All glory to God for that. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, but I went further. Let's go down scuba diving. Get your, get your love mask on. We got to go down into the course again. We're going back. Down. We're going back down into the obstacles of peace, because the next thing that Jesus talks about is the attraction of pain. Oh, why would I be attracted to pain? It must be the ego has got some deep things going on in that subconscious that I've been kept from awareness. I need to know about those. So here's what Jesus has to say now. I told you attraction of guilt. Now this is attraction of pain. Your little part is but to give the Holy Spirit the whole idea of sacrifice. Your little part is but to give the Holy Spirit the whole idea of sacrifice. You see how clever the ego is? 
It built Catholicism on the idea of sacrifice. It built an entire theology on sacrifice, and sacrifice is, is synonymous with pain. If you believe that you have to give up something real in this world to know God, you believe in sacrifice. Because you believe it's a sacrifice to give up the goodies of this world to know the kingdom of heaven, then you have an unconscious belief in sacrifice, and that's what's causing you your pain. And that's where the attraction is. Why do people say, well, I, I'm on a dating site and I, I found one that out of, out of all of them, they're like super attractive. And I say, what's so attractive? And they say, they score 10 on my list. <laughs> I say, I say uh, can you tell me more? What, why do they score a, a 10 on your list? Well, I like the color of their eyes and I like their hairstyle. I like their shape, their phys physique. I like that they're muscular. They score a 10. Uh, I want to date this one on the, the site. And then, if you, if you remember what I was talking about earlier, this is what Jesus has to say. I'm going to jump real quick, just for a brief time here, to uh, chapter 18. I talked about this earlier, where he's talking about sacrifice and, and fear and substitution. He said, while this appears to introduce quite, an, quite variable behavior, a far more serious effect lies in the fragmented perception from which the behavior stems. So the behaviors aren't the problems, it's the fragmented perception in the mind from which the behaviors stem that's the problem. Remember, Jesus says what you do comes from what you think. So we must work with your thoughts. You're not going to change anything by changing the behavior. So what? You go on a diet. You lose weight. Who cares? So what? You quit smoking. Who cares? In the overall scheme of things, you know. So you move from a tent into a mansion. Actually, who cares? It's, it's not the behavior that's important. It's the fragmented perception from which the behavior stems. So here, now this kind of applies to Marilyn Monroe, but it applies to all of us. This is what Jesus says, no one is seen complete. In other words, when you're using the five senses, you don't see your brothers and sisters in a holistic way. You don't see the light that they are. No one is seen complete. The body is emphasized with special emphasis on certain parts and used as the standard for comparison of acceptance or rejection for acting out a special form of fear. Whoa, we need to read that one again. Jesus, what are you doing? You're pulling the curtains on the, on the wizard here. No one is seen as complete. The body is emphasized with special emphasis on certain parts and used as the standard for comparison of acceptance or rejection for acting out a special form of fear. So basically, when we're talking about the attraction to pain, as long as you believe in the ego and you start breaking the world apart into pieces and parts, and then you listen to the ego and says, oh, these parts are better than those parts, if I'm going to date somebody, if I'm going to be married to somebody, if I'm going to live with somebody, they better have these parts and they better not have those parts. You see? That's how it works. That's how the ego is working here. This is special relationship. He's unveiling special relationship. And then he's saying, and now you wonder why you're not in total communication with everyone and everything. It's because you've got all these private thoughts, preferences that you are believing in as reality, and you're saying that that's your identity. I prefer this. Uh, I prefer, oh, here's my steak coming. Uh, more salt. Uh, can you take it back? I want, uh, I said medium rare. I didn't say rare. Didn't say well done. Take it back. You see, all the preferences that are part of the human personality, the preference packages, are the attraction to pain. 
and you think you're living your human life out, preferring what you prefer different from all the other people, but actually Jesus is saying, come on down with me. Let's look at the obstacles to peace and let's see what's going on. Attraction of guilt, attraction of pain. Oh, there's one more. What's, what's this? The attraction of death. Oh my gosh. This must have been underneath Marilyn Monroe. This is, must have been under the surface, way down there. The attraction of death. And this is what Jesus has to say. To you and your brother, in whose special relationship the Holy Spirit entered, it is given to release and be released from the dedication to death. For it was offered you and you accepted. Yet you must learn still more about this strange devotion for it contains the third obstacle that peace must flow across. No one can die unless he chooses death. What seems to be the fear of death is really its attraction. Guilt too is feared and fearful. Yet it could have no hold at all except on those who are attracted to it and seek it out. And so it is with death. Made by the ego, its dark shadow falls across all living things because the ego is the, quote, enemy of life. Attraction of death. Attraction of guilt. Attraction of pain. Attraction of death. Now that's my kind of book. You, this is not going to make the top sellers, the top 10 on Barnes & Noble. But if you really read what Jesus Christ is saying he's freeing your mind from the subconscious darkness of the ego. He's offering salvation in these teachings. Now, I, admittedly, that's probably why the Course is not a bestseller, because when people come to this chapter, on chapter 19, they probably pause and go, he's saying that I'm a death worshiper. <laughs> that's, that's basically what he's saying. Yeah, that's what he's saying. He's saying that as long as you believe in the ego and as long as you follow all of its beliefs and you try to act them out and, and reinforce them and believe in, then basically you're a death worshiper. And I don't know about you, but I like that to be told that because I'm interested in eternal life. If I've got something going on in the basement and I'm up in the surface trying to run through the sprinkler and, and have marshmallows and Hershey's and everything, and and there's a monster in the basement, I would rather open the basement door and go with Jesus down into the basement so I can be freed up for eternal life. I would rather get to the bottom of this death worshiper thing. Don't be discouraged when, when he tells you you're a death worshiper, because it's not really you, it's just your mind that believes in the ego is the death worshiper. You're not, you're the Christ. He's, he's saying, you're the Christ. So I always say, for Christ's sake, let's, let's at least look openly and honestly on what we believe so we don't continue to act out these unconscious beliefs. So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this trip into the basement with me. Uh, now we'll go back to our Irish uh, detective and he is going to He's going to help us find out what really happened in the final hours of Marilyn Monroe's life. No more a mystery. He's going to uh, pull the curtain on the whole thing. Okay. Well, this is a very deep dive and it's, it's not often that I show a, a suicide movie like uh, Whitney or in this case, like Marilyn Monroe. But <clears throat> what I like to say at the end, and this is this will be the deepest teachings, and, and this is this is very important, is that for human beings there's there is a tremendous fear around sickness and pain and suffering and, and a very much a fear of death. 
But what I'm going to tell you is <clears throat> that in terms of form, both birth and death are projections of concepts that the ego made up. It, it invented birth and it projects it onto the learning device, the body. And it invented death and it projects that onto the learning device. But if the body doesn't really die, which it doesn't, the body doesn't really die. And of course it's not really born, it's part of a hallucination, a trick. It's a trick to think that your life is between birth and death. That's, there'll come a point in your spiritual awakening where you'll laugh at the ideas of birth and death. You'll, you'll say, oh my gosh, how could I have been duped into believing that life was in form and that life began at birth and ended at death. All the great mystical teachings have said, no, it's not what it seems. Um, sometimes people will ask me when I travel around the world, they will say, what, what can you tell me, David, about um, life after death? And it's like, well, there, life is before death. Uh, before Abraham was, I am. Uh, eternal life precedes the chaotic belief in death, uh, which is of the ego. And the eternal life is real and the ego is not. So from what I was saying is, if you start to realize that death is, doesn't actually occur in form, it's just a projection, I'll say, of the death wish. So it's a trick to fool you into believing that your, your life has an end. It's a, it's, a, it's a trick of the ego. But of course Jesus tells us the ego will pursue you beyond the grave. So he's telling us, just by a body dying, um, that's not the end of the ego. Unless your mind resurrects, like his did. <laughs> and, and so, where he could say, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I mean, Jesus is, is this beautiful symbol of eternal life, that you can't kill the Christ, that Christ never dies. So if you let me develop this a little bit, what I'm saying is, is the, the death is not physical, uh, sickness is not physical. Death and sickness are just in the mind. It's actually coming from the ego. The ego is the death and the sickness. It's synonymous with death. Uh, even Sigmund Freud had this right. You know, Sigmund Freud, remember way back with Sigmund Freud, he said uh, that the ego was a death wish. Mm -hmm. he, then he went on to think that it had some helpful purposes. No. The, Jesus says, actually, there are no helpful purposes in a death wish because it's obscuring eternal life. So there's nothing helpful about the ego. It doesn't even exist. How could it be helpful? <laughs> you know, it's not who you are. But what I want to say is, I'm going to give you a few quotes on death from A Course in Miracles. And the first one is, <clears throat> this is Jesus, you know, he's just told us the dynamics of worshiping death in uh, chapter 19. And he's he spilled the beans on everything of the ego, but he's always encouraging us to wake up. And so here's what he has to say. He says, Swear not to die, you holy son of God. You make a bargain which you cannot keep. How's that for a pep talk? From the from the Lord of life, swear not to die, you holy son of God. So you can see he's like saying, wake up, wake up with me, wake up, wake up. And then another passage we, we could say is that um, Jesus does a sermon on death in Lesson 163 and Lesson 167, <laughs> and that he says, Basically, that, the, that death is a belief in your mind. So, he said, um, any feeling, any experience that you have that is not supremely happy is death. So now he's really lifting the definitions from the physical into the, the deeper, higher realms of the mind. He says, um, a, a little... Uh, Pain, a little stab of pain, a little worldly pleasure, 
Even a sigh of weariness is death. Oh, 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 oh my! Pull the pull the curtains, pull the rug out. Even a sigh of weariness is death. Because what he's teaching us is our mind is extremely powerful and extremely active and extremely alive always. Because that's how God created it. But when you believe in the ego, you can feel weary, tired. But he basically is, is telling us that um, uh, you are you are not really capable of being tired, but you are capable of wearying yourself. The strain of constant judgment is virtually intolerable. You see, by that sentence Jesus is saying, by your belief and devotion in the ego, you are wearying yourself. And you are causing a strain on your mind due to judgment. And remember what he taught in the Bible, judge not, lest you be judged. He's wanting us to forgive the world and release our mind from the strain of worshiping death. He's telling us to worship God by being joyful, happy, loving, innocent, by being as God created us. We actually are worshiping God by just being as we were created to be. It's not like we have to constantly be saying words Praise God, praise God, 24 hours a day, because God doesn't even understand words. Because <laughs> God didn't invent them. But, if we are as God created us, when we're happy, joyful, free-flowing, loving, we are praising God because we are saying, I am as God created me. You see? So it's a different kind of praise. It's not a praise with words, it's a praise with state of mind. When you're happy, then you're honoring God and praising God. <laughs> when you're joyful, you're praising God. When you're, when you're laughing, you're praising God. Because you're remembering to laugh at, at this uh, ego in this world. So, basically what I'm really saying here is that we have a mission and our mission is to realize that, that death isn't in form. We don't have to be afraid of whatever we imagine death to be in form, what we need to do is we, we actually need to forgive the ego and be happy now. Uh, like the song, when you're smiling, when you're smiling, the whole world smiles with you. You know, we know the song, when you are happy, the whole world is happy. When you are joyful, the whole world is joyful, because there is no world apart from your mind. So you see, that's how you turn the table on the ego. Your very happiness is the end of the ego. Because the ego is a death wish. And death is not a happy thought. <laughs> that's something where Jesus is saying, just don't protect it. You know, I'll shine it away if you just don't hide any thoughts from me, don't hide any thoughts from the Holy Spirit, then I will easily shine away the darkness. But if you choose to protect it, you're choosing to be attracted to guilt. You're attracted to pain and you're attracted to death. If you don't choose the, the forgiveness way to eternal life, you're going to be attracted to these things and you won't be happy if you choose the ego. So it's a convincing job, and I know for myself, you know, when I found the Course 36 years ago, honestly, what was my honest reaction when I opened up the Course, and when I started reading the Course, what was my honest first reaction to A Course in Miracles, is I looked at it, I felt this huge love wash over me, and my first thought was, with a big smile on my face, now I have no more excuses. That was my first thought, honestly. First time opening up the course, first time reading it, smile on my face, honestly, I have no more excuses. I have no more excuses now. And Jesus was in there going, right, <laughs> good, good, good call. <laughs> you asked for help, I sent you help, 
And now let's get at the purpose of forgiveness. Don't waste your life on anything in form. Don't get caught up in the idols. Don't get caught up chasing idols. Uh, we need to forgive. This is important stuff. <laughs> this is this is actually for the whole universe. This isn't for just you as, as a person. This is for the entire universe. So, uh, Wow, wasn't that fun? I hope you had as much fun with me. I, I don't know that I'll be showing any more suicide movies. Uh, probably next week I'll get back to the comedies because I know you, you enjoy those. But I thought it wouldn't hurt to do a little Root Canal, a little Roto-Rooter uh, every once in a while just so you realize how important this is. Your mind training is so important. It's, it's not a tiny thing at all. So thank you all. I love to see your smiling faces. I'm so grateful you joined in with me. And we're all in this together in laughter. Esther's got her and the world will end in laughter t-shirt on. There she is with a <laughs> she's she's got the world will end in laughter t-shirt. She's ready. Love you all. Keep your heart goggles on when you go down to that unconscious part. Make sure you got your heart goggles on. Because you need those love goggles when you go down there to the trenches. Okay.